Do you found the skeleton? How would you tell them that was happening? You first, first, first. How would you tell them? Well, interesting question. I don't know. 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 Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Today we're going to take a look at a video from a couple of years ago from Drs. Brian Thomas and Timothy Cleary in which they answer questions from their audience about dinosaurs. Before we get too far into the introduction, I want to say that the original sound was atrocious. The left and right audio tracks were out of sync and Dr. Thomas was quiet on one track and essentially inaudible on the other. I isolated one track and got rid of the other, then boosted the high and low frequencies to make Thomas a little easier to hear, and also manually adjusted the volume throughout to try to get Thomas and Clary somewhat even in volume. The result is what I consider tolerable, but not great. Sorry if the audio quality isn't as good as you'd like. Anyway, back to talking about doctors Thomas and Clary. As far as I can tell, they're both actual PhDs. Clary is a geologist and Thomas is a biochemist. Neither of them are actual paleontologists, as we'll see, but let's check in on them after their intro and see how long they go before they tell blatant lies that really piss me off. Uh, what distinguishes dinosaurs from the large lizards we have today? Good question. I would answer first with the positioning of the limbs. Dinosaurs, like mammals, have erect limbs, whereas lizards have sprawling limbs. Dinosaurs also have individual tooth sockets, for those with teeth, whereas lizards have a groove in the jaw from which the teeth grow. Dinosaurs also have a hole in their skull in front of the eye socket, called an antorbital fenestra. They also have a hip socket that's just a ring of bone, so that if you were looking at the hip from the side, you could see right through the hip socket all the way to the other side. This is called an open acetabulum. Dinosaurs also have more vertebrae in their hip region, called the sacral vertebrae, than lizards, and the vertebrae are strongly attached to the hip in a structure called the syncecrum. Lizards also have a hole at the top of their skull that dinosaurs lack, called the parietal foramen. It's used in lizards to allow the pineal gland to sense light and thereby regulate the lizard's day-night cycle of biological activity. Dinosaurs lack this. There are other things, but those are the main differences I would point out. Am I supposed to answer this one? Or yes. Well, we both, both can, but you go ahead first. <laughs> well, dinosaur, dinosaurs and large lizards. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs are extinct. Large lizards are not yet. Um, That's dumb. First, dinosaurs are not extinct. Second, who cares? We don't classify things in taxonomy on the basis of whether they're extinct. Woolly mammoths don't stop being mammals or proboscideans because they're extinct, but elephants aren't. And of course, the question implies that perhaps there is no real difference between large lizards and dinosaurs, which would mean that if that were true, dinosaurs wouldn't be extinct. Of course, lizards aren't dinosaurs, and birds are. But regardless, pointing out the extinction of a group of animals doesn't tell us anything about the biological differences between them and other animals. And, and they're yeah they're alive, but you can see these large lizards. Mm -hmm. They have they have legs positioned in a way that sort of goes out from the body mm -hmm. and then down to, toward the ground. So like mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. their legs are sort of out and then down. And then but uh, dinosaur reptiles had a different anatomy. They had their legs mm -hmm. that went straight down. Mm -hmm. Huh? Just like modern birds. Interesting. And I don't know if the camera can pick mm -hmm. up sort of the the bottom of the T Rex here, but. You can see T-Rex's legs are positioned beneath the mm -hmm. body, and he was big enough mm -hmm. to where he had mm -hmm. to have that. If you stick mm -hmm. alligator legs that go out and then down, mm -hmm. T-Rex would have just crawled around in the mud and wouldn't mm -hmm. have been able to get up and get around because the physics would be he'd be mm -hmm. too heavy for this position for this structure to support him. Anyways, but even small dinosaurs had legs that go straight down. But the what we call the open mm -hmm. acetabulum. Oh hey, I mentioned that as well as the leg thing. Fun fact, every bird that ever birded has an open acetabulum. Is what um, all dinosaurs had, mm -hmm. and that's just a, um, the hip socket was a, was a, was, you could see right through it. So the femur bone would come up and, and articulate with the hip socket or the, or the acetabulum, which is a hole in the hip. Uh, in us, it's a cup, and so in, in mm -hmm. mammals, including humans, the femur it articulates in a cuff like this. Mm -hmm. In birds, it's a cup. What's a lie? We couldn't get through the first question without lying about birds? Fun. All birds, fossil or extinct, have open acetabula, Dr. Thomas. If you ever watch this, I invite you to name a bird with a closed acetabulum. I dare you, you piece of Either you don't know what the you're talking about, and so you should just shut up, or you're a liar. So which is it? Are you absurdly incompetent, or are you just a dishonest hack? Some extinct birds, it's a partial cup. Oh, just more lies. Interesting how we don't get any names of these extinct birds, isn't it? That's because there are none. 
but in dinosaurs it was just mm -hmm. open, and so mm -hmm. the, the femur would um, would uh, would um, yeah would connect with a, a big old vacant hole, probably filled in with connective tissue and things mm -hmm. like that. So yeah, it probably wasn't just a void. Good call, Brian. Is it, does that answer the probably way too much detail well, than what anyone wants? I want to add one other thing, and the geology confirms that. We, when we look at the footprints of dinosaurs, we see they're very close together, and mm -hmm. just like you would walk if you were a mammal. Uh, so they're not sprawled out like crocodiles and turtles and reptiles today. These are reptiles that walked with their legs erect, even four-legged and two-legged. Here's a fun thing. Floods characteristically erase trace fossils in footprints in unlithified sediment. So if the flood were the cause of the fossil record, and ICR thinks basically everything from the Cambrian until the start of the Holocene is flood rock, we shouldn't find any fossil footprints. We do, so we can be well assured there was no global flood. And so we see the footprints, they almost step on top of each other with the forelegs sometimes. And so there's no tail draggings. Uh, so if they were sprawling like crocodiles, we'd see tail draggings, we'd see these animals. You know, but the, the, the rocks support the interpretation that Sir Richard Owen came up with in 1841, that these are a unique group of reptiles that had an erect posture. Well, at least we're doing better than Answers in Genesis' own Kurt Wise, who seems to think that the only reason we don't find tail drags is that the tails are floating and that all dinosaur footprints were made underwater. Because if not, we'd see the tail drags. Always good to see someone doing just one bit better on something than another young Earth creationist. Well, you say no tail drags, there's probably a few, mm. but generally. But only with, yeah, I, I did hear about one where they were walking in mud so deep mm -hmm. that their tails were dragging. Yes, there are a few tail marks here and there, but like Dr. Perry said, they're explained by unusual circumstances like deep mud or the animal rearing up or other such things. So they held their tail aloft. Mm -hmm. Just like birds, which hold their tails, short though they may be, parallel to the ground. Neat! After this, Dr. Thomas just points out that in the 70s and 80s, most people, paleontologists included, thought of dinosaurs as tail draggers. I really have nothing to say about this, he's basically right, and science updated. Were all dinosaurs really gray? No, we know for a fact some were not gray. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an early... That's from pictures, mm -hmm. and some artists mm -hmm. decided to show dinosaurs that mm -hmm. way a long time ago. And they mm -hmm. also decided to show dinosaurs with droopy tails that dragged. Mm -hmm. We already covered the tails. Move past it. Uh, but closer um, uh, examination of the mm -hmm. anatomy. I'm thinking, of course, of brontosaurus, mm -hmm. like the classic um, sauropod four-legged dinosaur. Right. And its tail didn't drag. And we can All tell right. because... Are you kidding me? No, we're not going to continue to listen to him talk about transverse processes and ligaments in a question about dinosaur color. Speaking of which, velociraptors actually have a straightened tail mm -hmm. as they would get these ossified tendons. And so their tail was flexible where it came off the body, but then it would stay straight. Gee, a tail that is flexible at the proximal end, but then inflexible at the distal end. I wonder where I've heard of something like that in the modern world. Oh, right. Birds. And there is actually muscles they show that are attached. They believe that each step it took, the tail was swinging back and forth to balance the animal. But many of the dinosaurs actually had these straightened tails. They couldn't, you know, they weren't really that flexible, but they were built to balance the front end, balance them around that hip. If it's a two-legged animal, it balanced on the hip. If it's four-legged, they balanced on, you know, both hips. But there's a lot of hip and evidence in the fossils themselves that supports this in addition. So back to the color question. Finally. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they were all gray at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I know of one study of a Psittacosaurus, mm -hmm. it's fun to say, mm -hmm. and um, they found, Vinther and uh, colleagues found uh, pigments mm -hmm. still in the skin. It's like a naturally mm -hmm. mummified dinosaur carcass, mm -hmm. which itself is something mm -hmm. to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> we will. We will. We will. Okay. Yep, this is one of the best preserved dinosaurs ever found. Near as I can tell, the first formal description of the pigmentation was in 3D camouflage of an Ornithischian dinosaur by Jakob Vintner, et al., published in Current Biology, Volume 26, Issue 18, on the 26th of September, 2016. Link in the description. Uh, but they found it's darker on its back mm -hmm. and lighter colored on its belly. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the integrity of the mm -hmm. pigment uh, so high that we can tell exactly what colors, mm -hmm. but we right. can tell the shades of some of these mm -hmm. dinosaurs because their skin is still mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. in some cases. No, the skin is not there. It's preserved in the form of a calcium phosphate residue. I probably don't have to tell my audience this, but apparently I do have to tell these two PhDs, but skin isn't made of calcium phosphate. 
This is not a fossil with skin. It's a fossil with fossilized skin, in which are remnants of pigment. And it's preserved. Like, wow, how does that happen? I don't know how it happened. And other than it was preserved in carbonaceous clay with silt, it, it doesn't seem like much study has been done specifically on the taphonomy of this particular find. But that such study hasn't really been done doesn't make it a flood deposit. If they want to argue for that, they'll have to do more than point out that it's a rare find. They'll actually have to go give positive evidence indicative of a flood in the matrix in which this Cetacosaurus was found. There's melanosomes, which, melanosomes. Yeah, in some cases, some mm -hmm. melanosomes, which is mm -hmm. the, it's a cell. No, they're not cells. They're intracellular organelles. That means they're made in cells and then pushed into the space between cells. They are not cells, not at all. This is basic stuff here. It's still intact. Mm -hmm. The cell, um, yeah, it turns into a melanosome. Mm -hmm. Which is a pigment, uh, pigmented uh, structure. Mm -hmm. No, cells don't turn into melanosomes. Cells like melanocytes manufacture them, and it's not intact, it's preserved. It has been chemically altered, but retains the basic shape and dark color from its original form. And so you can look inside those and go, oh, well, this is dark, or this is light. Mm -hmm. And so that's similar to what you see on a deer, where it's got the dark back mm -hmm. and the light belly. And it's good. Um, it's a good uh, sort of a camouflage shading for a creature that would live in a forested or treed environment. Yeah. In fact, the paper adds an idealized counter shading for forested versus open environment, and then points out that the actual pigmentation of Cetacosaurus was closer to the forested ideal, and it's very close to it, indicating that Cetacosaurus was probably a forest dwelling animal. So, probably. I mean, maybe they had different colors. I don't mm -hmm. think they were wild full of fancy colors mm. like birds. Mm. I don't think that at all. There's no evidence mm. for that. Okay, first he's saying that while standing in front of a green Tyrannosaurus Rex. So, yeah. Second, I don't know if Thomas is just not paying attention or if he's a liar. But we do know that dinosaurs had fancy bird-like coloration, like iridescent feathers and Microraptor. Microraptor is a close relative of animals like Deinonychus and Velociraptor. It's kind of like how a fox differs from a wolf. And as reported in the journal Science by Kan Guo Li et al. in their paper, Reconstruction of Microraptor and the evolution of iridescent plumage, the feathers of Microraptor were iridescent because we can see the microstructure that would cause this in high power scanning electron microscopes. They were most similar to the iridescent structures in the Brazil duck among five extant bird controls, those being the tufted titmouse, the macaroni penguin, the double breasted cormorant, the pond cockatoo, and of course the aforementioned Brazil duck. This paper came out eight years before this video was uploaded, so plenty of time to update their information. They just don't care. But I don't think either that they were just drab and gray, mm. every single one. You know, they had, they had different shades. They may have had some different mm -hmm. subtle colors, probably greenish. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think that some modern reptiles might have a greenish. Well, green is actually one of the least likely colors. Most lizards are not green, although there are notable exceptions like iguana iguana, the green iguana. Green is a hard color for most animals to make as a pigment. In fact, green birds don't even use green pigments. They use structural blue coloration and a yellow pigment. I'm not saying it's impossible, but black, red, and yellow are far more likely. Green is unlikely, and blue is least likely. That being said, I'm sure there were some dinosaurs in the past that were green, as there are some now, such as members of genus Amazona. If I remember right, I think even some stripes might have been existed on some of the tails. There's some of those melanosomes, I believe, on Sinoceropteryx, I believe, that showed maybe like a, a brown and white pattern. Yes, Sinoceropteryx had red and white stripes and other markings. We can tell because of the preserved Rufus melanosome in its, wait for it, Feathers. We don't have skin pigmentation information for Sinoceropteryx, only feather color. This is a weird animal for creationists to bring up since they've already heavily implied they reject the idea that birds are dinosaurs, even though nothing about that bare fact is a problem for young earth creationism. These are the types who I'm quite confident will deny that any dinosaur had feathers at all. Then they just go on about other finds with clues to coloration. It's not really very important. Okay. We'll kind of get back to how many dinosaurs do you think got off the ark? Or, you know, what, some people wonder were dinosaurs even on the ark? None, because Noah's Ark, as believed by young Earth creationists, never existed. And, uh, you know, we at ICR, we believe that God's word is true, and that he said two of every kind were on the Ark. And so I'll just leave. How many, how many do you well, think two, God ought? Two of them. That's what she said. <laughs> Michael. Michael. <laughs> two of every kind of, of land dwelling, mm -hmm. air breathing mm -hmm. uh, creature. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Genesis 7 specifies two of every kind of creature mm -hmm. that lived on land and had the breath of life in its nostrils. Mm -hmm. And if you look at dinosaur fossils, you can see those nostrils were there. So they walked on land, uh, or at least they could walk on land. Mm 
um, and they have mm -hmm. nostrils. So mm -hmm. I think that qualifies them as being arc inhabitants. And um, Okay, I don't have much to say about whether dinosaurs on the whole met the requirements for being on the ark, as laid out in Genesis. They seem to have. But what I do want to ask is, what is that model? A naked, shrink-wrapped, broken-wristed dromaeosaur? Presumably juvenile. This isn't Jurassic Park. These people are pretending to do science. This hasn't been a good reconstruction for decades, and even if we want to pretend that dromaeosaurs didn't have feathers, which they absolutely did, even though we have fossils of them with obvious unmistakable feathers, why break the wrists? The hands of dinosaurs face palm to palm like the animals were about to clap, not facing the back of the body like they were about to slap their knees. Further, the inferior temporal fenestra is clearly visible, but that would be full of muscle, and so not a sunken depression. A similar point is with the antorbital fenestra, which was filled with a sinus in life, and so again, it shouldn't be sunken into the skull. Basically, this reconstruction would have been iffy even in the 1980s and early 90s. In the late 2010s or 2020s, it's laughably bad. Uh, so agree. yeah, so, so then the next question is how many? How many? And so to answer that, you have done some research on that. Ooh, I can smell the kind of nonsense coming. Well, you were there, right? And so you've yeah, just kind of. I am older than you, yes. Uh, I've been about a decade or so in there longer. But uh, no, I never saw a dinosaur that I didn't like. I uh, <laughs> only found the bones. Uh, but I think there's maybe a minimum or maybe even a maximum of about 60 kinds. There's about 60 families of dinosaurs. and Ah, uh, yes. The implication that the arbitrarily defined families of Linnaean taxonomy that have no real definition, just happen to usually luck into the distinct created units of biology. How convenient for creationists. It lets them skip the hard work of actually figuring out what a kind could possibly be, how to tell if you have more than one kind or just one, and lets them have a get-out-of-jail-free card on one of the more obvious problems with the Noah's Ark story, that there is not enough room. Of course, I would contend that they have not fixed it, but oh well. Now, while I don't think they're going to touch on this, I think I should. There are attempts to use a version of evolutionary techniques to find the so-called created kinds through the use of a pseudoscience called baromenology, so named because, as a rule, Christian young earth creationists think they can just look up Hebrew words in a lexicon and stick them together like they're English without any regard for grammar. It's supposed to mean the study of created kinds, except the phrase they use doesn't mean created kinds, it means that a kind created something or other. What it created is unstated. Anyway, the linguistic ineptitude of creationists isn't the point here. The actual practice of their poorly named field is. Baromenology is essentially character-based cladistics. Animals with similar morphology tend to get grouped together. It, as a rule, studiously ignores genetic data, since if you want to lump lions and tigers together, as most creationists want to, and if you do this on the basis of genetics, you'd have no rationale for splitting humans and apes, as creationists are obligated to do, regardless of the evidence. This is because Panthera leo and Panthera tigris are far more genetically distant than Pantroglodytes and Homo sapiens. So, from the get-go, the whole endeavor is dishonestly cherry-picking data. Further, morphological clustering is said to indicate actual descent, which is fair enough for the most part, but when clusters themselves have enough morphological distance as measured in an n-dimensional character space, then the organisms are seen as not related, but this is a problem. You see, unless we have a complete or nearly so record of all organisms to have existed in a particular group that does have common ancestry, then we should expect discontinuity, and we should expect more of it as time goes on. On screen is a crude simulation of this idea. Each yellow dot represents a small population of indeterminate but noticeable size. The bottom is early in time and the top is late in time, whereas the left to right axis represents an approximate morphological distance, but this is only a very rough way to visualize it. However, it's sufficient for this exercise. As time goes on, the chances of us having access to the first members of this group is lower and lower, simply because the older a creature is, the more time any rocks bearing its fossils will have had to simply erode away robbing us of the chance to examine said creatures. Also, some organisms will simply not leave fossils, or by chance their fossils will simply not be discovered, even though they persist to the present, as shown by the uneven way these dots are disappearing. So at the end, we're left with these disconnected chunks with high correlation within each grouping, but gaps of various size between these coherent clusters. How many of these clusters share common ancestry? Well, if you hypothesize that they cannot all do so, you can set some distance value as your cutoff where common ancestry is no longer supported, and this is essentially what baromenology does. But we also know that this discontinuity is an artifact of preservation, not the result of not sharing common ancestry. Further, baromenologists routinely leave organisms out of their studies that are part of the group in question, which further removes some of the organisms that may well bridge the gaps that they find in their analyses. Finally, the biggest problem, in my opinion, is that they can't even really use baromenology, even with their cherry picking, to show what they want. It's trivial to do a baromenology study to recover humans as part of the same kind as apes. 
and it requires further cherry picking of which character traits to use and how to weight them in order to separate humans out. And of course, you really have to ignore the genetics. In short, even the most rigorous attempts by creationists to define their created kinds are fraught with deception and incompetence, and even then can't get the answers they want consistently. Many creationists, uh, creation biologists, believe the family was somewhat comparable to the dinosaur, to the kind of animal that the Bible refers to. Yeah, and as we've seen, for absolutely no good reason. This is just a thing they find convenient, so they cherry-pick data to get them these answers. And they aren't even consistent then. And so there's probably at least 60, there could have been more, I think in my book I say 60, but there might have been 60, 70, maybe even 80 kinds of dinosaurs, but there's not thousands of dinosaurs. There's, you know, there's been over 1,500 or so species named and fun fact, the family grouping of these species isn't based on some objective beyond the single criterion that they be a likely monophyletic group of genera. You can put the family wherever you want as long as it's monophyletic. You're not technically wrong unless it's below the generic level or what you have selected as a higher taxon. Anyone could come by and shift every single taxon up a bit in the tree of life and nothing would change about the conventional taxonomy except the names. Instead of an arthropod phylum, we'd have a panarthropod phylum that just includes tardigrades and velvet worms with their relatives, the crustaceans and arachnids. Similarly, instead of a hominid family of the great apes, it would just be hominoididae with the gibbons in the family too. This is just as valid, but now what? Do creationists shift the created kinds? Do they keep them below the new versions of family? What? That's the problem with assuming that the arbitrary use of family in taxonomy reflects some real level of biological grouping that is similar or the same across a wide swath of living things. A family of beetles in real life is a very different thing to a family of primates, with the former being vastly larger in terms of diversity and species count than the latter. But who cares? To creationists, they can just use their handy heuristic that if a group name ends in I-D-A-E, it's probably just a kind. So Carabidae is a beetle family with 40,000 extant species, including two distinct lineages of bombardier beetles. And Moscidae is a family of even-toed ungulates with only seven species and about 35 or 36 extinct species. And sure, Carabidae has much higher genetic diversity, but hey, why not just assume that these vastly different taxa are basically the same thing? Direct creations of God. That's not completely insane and about as ad hoc as can possibly be imagined. But you know who's not insane? My subscribers. So if you're not already subscribed, why not go ahead and fix that? It's free and it really helps the channel out. While you're at it, turn on notifications with the bell icon. But if you're a paleontologist, you would find the bones of different dog breeds and you would name them all different species as well because they all look different. Every time a creationist brings up the morphological diversity of dogs, I want to throw something. Dogs are anomalously morphologically diverse because humans made them that way. Wild, undomesticated populations have never been found with that much diversity. If you want to suggest that, say, Centrosaurus, Pachyrhinosaurus, Triceratops, and Diabloceratops are all the same species, then go find a wild species with a similar amount of morphological diversity. Until then, shut the f*** up about paleontologists ignoring the example of dogs when it comes to defining morpho species. Because guess what? They're not. You're just an idiot. And so species are named... Right. Species are named... Yeah, just as very subtle things and they name a new species because it gives them a publication. And then obviously they try to get more research money, the more publications you have. You kind of build your academic credentials through publications. I'm not going to stand here and say that there is not more incentive to publish a find as a new species or even genus than there is to describe a new member of an already established taxon. But that in itself is not enough to say that the current known diversity of dinosauria should be assessed as much smaller than is the consensus. In fact, there are papers published seeking to subsume some taxa under older ones, such as uniting several very similar genera into one. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why there's so many dinosaurs out there, but there's really only 60, maybe 70, possibly 80 kinds of dinosaurs. So you really need double that on the ark, male and female. And Yeah, I'm going to need a citation on that one, preferably one that did more than simply count up how many dinosaur taxa end in IDAE, and then just calling that the number of kinds. But somehow, I don't think I'll ever get one. As I talk about, and you've talked about, probably juveniles around the Ark, you wouldn't have full-size T-Rexes like this, probably, on the Ark. Uh, they take up a lot of room, and they eat a lot, and... Well, they are smaller, but it's not obvious that they eat significantly less. Humans are well known for the phenomenon that children often eat a huge amount of food to fuel their growth. Anyone who's had to feed teenage boys can attest to this. What makes creationists think that this wouldn't be a problem for active animals like dinosaurs, many of which may well have been warm-blooded? 
Further, many dinosaur species may have been highly social, and raising infants of social species in isolation often results in antisocial behaviors and a failure to reestablish the typical social systems of such animals. So it's probably not the case that simply bringing on juveniles of large animals is likely to result in a population of functional adults while saving food. On the whole, you'd probably need about as much food, if not more, for juveniles over the course of the trip, and you'll end up with maladjusted animals who cannot live together. Maybe not be you know, a certain size, maybe they couldn't breed. You know, we, don't, we don't know. We don't know enough about dinosaurs to really know. But the young ones, of course, before they hit their growth spurt, would have uh, been most likely, but again, we don't know for sure. Oh, before the growth spurt. And you know that dinosaurs had growth spurts only after a year of age. How? Oh, right. They don't. As it turns out, being a diverse group of animals, dinosaurs had a variety of ontological strategies, from fast growing to slow growing, and from intense parental care to essentially none. You can't just generalize that juvenile dinosaurs are the answer to the huge problem that you simply don't have enough room on the ark. So how many? Uh, we're talking about, let's say, 70 roughly mm -hmm. families. And a family um... is a human construct that only has a real world analog in so much as it is a monophyletic group. But even in those cases, they can't be compared from one family to another. So assuming that even most families indicate some fundamental unit in biology is beyond stupid? Is that what we're about to hear? Because that would be true, and that's what we should hear. Which we're, which we're using as a rough equivalent mm -hmm. to kind. Maybe with enough repetition, it will stop sounding so stupid. And in, in scripture says, two of every kind. Mm -hmm. I've been over this, but the Hebrew word mean doesn't mean anything more than the general English word kind. You can have a kind of grammar, or a kind of day, or a kind of food, or a kind of animal. It's just a loose grouping of things, with no technical meaning. In one context, you could say that compared to a lizard, a kangaroo and a human are the same kind of animal. And in another context, you could say that the kangaroo is a different kind of animal to a human when compared to an anteater. The only reason creationists treat this like some kind of technical term is that on the one hand, it makes it easier to pretend that the Noah's Flood story literally happened, and on the other hand, it means that they can accept the parts of evolution that are so obviously true that even they can't deny them, like speciation and the common ancestry of fairly recent groups, like most mammal families. So we're saying probably two of every family, mm -hmm. uh, using the modern Linnaean classification, mm -hmm. kingdom final class order, family genus species, mm -hmm. uh, would be, for example, the triceratops mm -hmm. is a species or mm -hmm. a genus. Triceratops. Horridus, I think, is the species yeah, name. What's one of, yeah, one but, of them. The other being T. porosus, but sure. So that's one of them. But the family name is Ceratopsian. Mm. It's a, or, well, it's a Ceratopsian. So, so that's the tank-like dinosaurs with the big mm. frill. Some, some yeah. of them had a frill. Some of them had horns. Some had mm. no horns. Mm -hmm. But it's short neck, tank-like mm. body, four legs mm. on the floor. It's Ceratopsidae. But what do we do with the other Ceratopsians? Animals like Cetacosaurus, Yinlong, Liaoceratops, Gracilaceratops, Yamaceratops, Leptoceratops, Protoceratops, and Zuniceratops, all of which fall outside of Ceratopsidae proper, but which are increasingly like the Ceratopsids, and conveniently, are all found higher and higher in the strata. Are they in the same kind? Using the same logic used to unite Triceratops, Centrosaurus, and Chasmosaurus would also lump those together as a broader Ceratopsian suborder. Why don't they share a common ancestor? Is it just that Ceratopsidae has the ending that indicates it's a family? So sorry, Zuniceratops, you're another kind. See how arbitrary that is? Um, and uh, so all those mm -hmm. fit in that kind. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's Taurosaurus, mm -hmm. uh, Centrosaurus, there's Triceratops, and, and many others. But they're all in the same kind. Yeah. The same. So all you need is two Ceratopsians to come on board yeah. the ark. Oh, so now it's the whole suborder of Ceratopsia. Which is it, Brian? Ceratopsidae and Ceratopsia are not the same thing or interchangeable. Are we now able to say that Cetacosaurus and Triceratops are the same kind? And if so, how are we going to say that that huge amount of morphological difference is fine within kind, but that humans can't be in the same kind as other apes? Oh, right. There is no reason. It's just arbitrary and corresponds to the current whims of the creationist speaking. How convenient and how unlike anything resembling science. There's, yeah, there may be there may be a couple. There's a couple of them in there. There's Neoceratopsians and there's a couple there. It, the problem is it gets very complicated, as you know, because they find things, they reclassify things. So now Cetacosaurus is out. But since we're maybe at the point where Neoceratopsia is the thing, you can include Yinlong and Leptoceratops. Why could they be in the same kind as Triceratops, but Cetacosaurus can't be? Man, choosing such a well-known group of animals as Ceratopsians was a tactical blunder. They might be the dinosaur group with the best fossil record in terms of evolutionary transition that has ever been found. 
And they're not really using the Linnaean hierarchy anymore. They're using more cladistical analysis, yeah. which is based on statistics and subjective yeah, traits. Like, subjective I think traits. This trait, and yeah. I think that trait is and more important. Yeah, nothing is more subjective and wishy washy than actual hard math. But also, how do they think Linnaeus did things if they're such staunch taxonomist traditionalists? Oh, right. It was by analyzing the patterns of similarities and differences, but with less mathematical rigor. Basically, this is just two PhDs complaining that science prefers to use actual measurements where possible instead of just eyeballing it. Because eyeballing it works better for their claims, which in itself should raise some red flags. So they end up with all this, and so it's, it's more and more difficult to figure out how many real families there were. That's because there's no such thing as a real family. All Linnaean taxa are defined as just a group of similar lower taxa. They're completely arbitrary, as I already described when talking about how incomparable Carabidae and Moscidae are. But this is nothing new. In fact, the arbitrary nature of Linnaean ranks has been talked about for decades. The ranks are simply arbitrarily assigned within each higher taxon. So let's say 70. So it's 140. Yeah, yeah it's not that So many. 140, the average size of dinosaurs. You did a big study on this. Yeah, we did, we, we did the math. Jeff Tompkins and I at ICR did the math. Hey, editing dapper here. I just want to point out, because I didn't catch it in my script writing initially, uh, Jeffrey Tompkins doing the math isn't a good thing. This is a man who screwed up basic high school algebra in his supposed scientific paper by not weighting his averages for genetic similarity in his tests by sequence length. Yeah. That's like literally high school. So uh, Jeffrey Tompkins doing the math for you is not a good thing, buddy. We figured out the average adult size was the size of the American bison or buffalo. It's certainly true that many dinosaurs were quite small, but the problem is that food and water requirements don't scale linearly. They tend to increase exponentially. All things held equal, a dinosaur that's twice as tall as another will need some eight times as many calories per day. So even if you have relatively small average body size, which they do not, by the way, bison bison is quite a large animal, if you only have a few outliers on the high side, it will severely increase the amount of space needed for food. But honestly, how you fit animals on the ark is for me one of the least troublesome aspects of the Ark. Most flood models involve the Earth becoming a ball of radioactive plasma. So how you fit the animals on a big wooden boat that in this scenario has already turned into ash, or well, more accurately, it can't have turned into ash because we're at the point where chemistry can't happen, it's just turned into a ball of unassociated nuclei and electrons, isn't really a concern of mine. Let's just pretend that the Ark was bigger on the inside. Who cares? Noah's having his organs turned to soup by radiation just from within his own body, and his skin is being flash charged with crisp by the heat of external radiation and tectonic plates rushing around at race car speeds. But if they were juveniles, they might have been size of sheep, an adult sheep. But in fact, the idea that the average size of a dinosaur was the size of a sheep goes back to the wonderful peer-reviewed article, Jurassic Park, published in Penguin Random House in 1990. And yes, I'm serious. Jackson Wheat and R.J. Downard did the legwork of tracking this claim down, and that's the first time they could find it. And after 1990, it started showing up in creationist talking points. So they might have been fairly small. So if you don't, if you don't take the big daddy mm -hmm. T-Rex, you just take a, a, a mm -hmm. teenage T-Rex. Mm -hmm. And if you don't take the big daddy, you know, a Patasaurus, mm -hmm. you just take the little 11-year-old. Mm -hmm. Little. Yeah. <laughs> he would still right. be, you know, yeah. 20, 30 feet long or whatever. Yes, because teenagers are known for eating so little. And here's the thing. The problem isn't really pen space for housing animals. It's storing the food and water. And doing so in a time when smoking and salting were basically the only reliable ways to keep food fresh for a year. But that option isn't available to all animals. Anteaters don't have teeth and must be fed insects. Now, to be fair, they can eat mashed up insects, so they don't need live prey, but they still need fresh insect slurpees daily. That means that Noah had to keep live feeder colonies to feed animals like anteaters, echidnas, some bats, pangolins, and alvarosaurids to keep the dinosaurs in the mix. Further, not only do koalas need fresh eucalyptus leaves, meaning Noah had to keep at least one such highly toxic tree alive on a ship with one window for a year, but koalas are so dumb that they won't eat leaves that aren't attached to something branch-like. You can't just pick the leaves. You basically have to keep the koalas where you keep the tree, since other than pooping and eating, they basically do nothing else but sleep. And if you wake them up, they're liable to scratch your face off, because they are mean. And also, this is nothing to say of the water requirements. Most land animals require fresh water to drink, and fresh water spoils, which is why alcoholic beverages were so important during the age of sale. It wasn't just for morale. It was that beer wouldn't become unsafe to drink after a few months, but fresh water would. Now, cows drink about a gallon and a half of water per 100 pounds of animal, or about 12 liters per 100 kilograms. 
Now he said about 30 feet long for a sauropod, which is about how long Camelotia is, and it had an estimated body mass of 22,000 pounds, or just under 10,000 kilograms. That means that it would need about 330 gallons of water, or about 1,200 liters of water a day. Noah was on the ark for about 400 days, and he needs to water two such animals, so we're looking at 264,000 gallons, or about a million liters of water. That's a lot of water to keep fresh for just two animals. What's Noah going to do? Collect 660 gallons of water in rain each day just for two animals? Well, let's do the math on that one. The surface area of the top of the ark, which is the maximum area for rainwater collection, was 520,200 square feet. I'm using feet here because that's what Answers in Genesis uses, and they're the place that bothers to use actual published measurements for the boat. This means that every day, to water one species of dinosaur on rainwater, it would have to rain about six inches. That's a lot of rain. That would likely rival daily rainfall records in most parts of the world, and that has to be kept up after the rain was supposed to stop, so you really need even more during the actual rainy days. Now, you could say, what about desalination? Well, even with modern technology, it's unreliable and energy intense, and by energy intense, I mean you probably set fire to a wooden boat. So that seems out. One might also wonder how one could keep those eucalyptus trees alive during such a downpour, since they need sunlight. But not 130. But not 130. Mm -hmm feet long, and so you put those on board the ark, mm -hmm. and the average size would be something like a sheep, uh, mm -hmm. and then, so you have 140 sheep, mm -hmm. and I think uh, we've done feasibility studies mm -hmm. on that, and uh, would, that would take up one corner of one of the three decks of mm -hmm. Noah's ark, leaving plenty of space for, for all the, the other, other kinds. Mm -hmm. kinds. Funny, though, how when you actually bother to do even basic math, it suddenly becomes pretty infeasible. And of course, that's ignoring the fact that everything would be on fire anyway. So who cares if you could get enough water? So so then they got off the ark. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Well, since there's not evidence of them interacting with humans at all, and here I assume we're excluding birds, it seems that they almost immediately went extinct, making the ark pretty useless and got pretty silly. That is, if you decide to take this story as literal history. Well, that's the next interesting question. Is it really? But we'll get to the what happened to the ultimate result later. But here's a question when they got off the ark. Were any dinosaurs domesticated and used as pets, do you think? Probably not. And they agree to. So let's move on. Well, I think it's, it's, it's critical that we show people that God's word is true. Mm. And that real science, unlike what you're taught in many of the universities and colleges and high schools and public institutions, real science supports the Bible. Real science shows there was a flood. Well then, maybe you shouldn't have started out with a blatant lie about science. Here's the thing, professional creationists either know better and they're liars, or they don't and they're just incompetent. There's no real middle ground. The closest to a middle ground we have is Todd Wood, who knows he can't really support young earth creationism, but he wants to try anyway. He knows he doesn't have evidence and that evolution does. He's only being intellectually dishonest, not regular dishonest. If science really supported the young earth creationist point of view, there would be no need to lie about bird anatomy, geology, physics, astronomy, genetics, etc. to support it. And yet every source purporting to support young earth creationism that I've ever encountered has verifiably untrue things stated as facts, without fail. That's not the mark of science supporting you. That's the mark of desperation to be right when we can all see, as plain as the nose on your face, that you're wrong. And this level of reality denial is why I compare the young earth to the flat earth. Young earth has more money and is more sophisticated, but ultimately they're both about ignoring aspects of reality that are inconvenient to you because you decided without good reason to believe something that is obviously untrue. In my research as a geologist, I plot up sediments and compile sedimentary rock records all over the world. And I'm not quite full through the whole world, but I've gotten through part of it now. And that's showing each continent you know, doing the same things at the same time, flooding Which at the same all, level all the at the same time. The, same. the vast majority of the Phanerozoic rocks cannot be flood rocks because there is no mechanism for a flood to deposit them. Things like limestone, fine-grained non-flocculated shale, aeolian sandstone, subaerial tuff, evaporites, etc. all cannot form under a flood and are all found at various places in the supposed flood rocks. This is just the same argument as someone looking at a boat going over the horizon and declaring that this is proof of the flat earth. It's the exact opposite. Nothing about the geology of the Earth even hints at a global flood. Not one scrap. That's why it's not taken seriously in science, only in pseudoscientific churches masquerading as science institutes. Pattern. The same general pattern to all the continents. They all begin kind of gradual flooding, and then they become progressively more and more and more up to a point, and then they, the water, you can see the water receding, pushing sediments offshore. 
And so you see that same general so pattern throughout. Water sediments. But he didn't reach that conclusion after coming to the data with an open mind and seeing what they suggest. He came to that conclusion prior to any data and then just used a series of post hoc rationalizations to force the data into that paradigm while simply tossing out data that don't fit, which is nearly all the data. Science works by looking at observations and data first and then drawing conclusions from that. Creationism already has an inviolable conclusion that is assumed absolute truth at the outset, and then it seeks to conform any and all data to that conclusion, no matter how implausible it is. That is the opposite of science, literally the opposite. Creationists could be sitting in a padded room smearing their feces on the wall and be closer to really doing science than they are doing what they actually do. It doesn't matter how much math you do, how many tables you have in your publications, how many samples you send off to be tested, how many degrees you get, or how many big words you use. If you start with a conclusion and then fit the data into it, you're anti-science. You're the opposite of a scientist. Brian Thomas, Timothy Clary, Gabriella Haynes, Andrew Snelling, Nathaniel Jeanson, Jason Lyle, Stephen Austin, Gunter Beckley, Danny Faulkner, Georgia Purdom, Arthur Chadwick, Taz Walker, Jonathan Sarfati, Robert Carter, Kurt Wise, Jeffrey Tompkins, Frank Sherwin, and all the rest are not scientists. They don't do science. They don't just do pseudoscience. They do anti-science. And yes, it's important to call these people out by name. This isn't an activity of a nameless, faceless bunch of liars and imbeciles. This is a direct attack on the very fundamentals of science by these individual people and many others, but these are some of the more prominent and public faces of creationism. The rocks really do show exactly what the Bible says, and that's, that's one of the things that at, at ICR we do is we show that real science confirms the youthfulness of our universe, the youthfulness of the Earth, the re recent flood. And all you have to do is ignore nuclear physics, thermodynamics, all of geology, astronomy, taxonomy, genetics, paleontology, meteorology, quantum physics, etc. After you've ignored more or less all of science, it can then be obvious that the universe is 750,000 times younger than it really is. The dinosaurs were real. The very fact that the audience they cultivate are the kind of people who have to be told that dinosaurs are real should tell you something. You know, there are some people that still doubt whether dinosaurs are real, but when you dig them up like you and I have done, we know they're real. How do you know that? And I really mean that. These are people who think that maybe limestone just got deposited in a flood under even heavier rock and don't see a problem with that, even though it's physically impossible. So on what basis can they say that dinosaur fossils aren't just flood deposited concretions that just happen to take the shape of bones of animals that never existed? There's no consistent reason they could give. The very same way that we know that dinosaurs are real is the same way we know the Earth isn't young. We know they're real because we know how fossilization works and what bones look like. But the problem is that we know how sedimentation works, and what flood deposits do and don't look like. And the rocks aren't just a bunch of flood deposits. So if Clary is going to say that he can tell that a dinosaur is real, he needs to justify it. And here's the thing, I don't think he can without invalidating his belief in a young earth that was flooded in the recent past. Now you, dear audience, might find that a bit far-fetched, and it is, but that's the thing. So is flood geology. But the difference is that most people are familiar enough with bones to more or less know one when we see one. But actual geologists are familiar enough with rocks to know a flood deposit when they see one. So it's actually a very fair comparison. Flood geologists can't actually identify any fossil as such with intellectual consistency. And, and the Bible tells us they run the ark because they're land. I don't care. If this were scientifically demonstrable, then we wouldn't need to reference the Bible. We could just demonstrate it scientifically. And if it were true, you wouldn't need to assume it's true at the outset. You could come to the data without that in mind and find that conclusion anyway. When it comes to science, there is no place for bringing your interpretation of the Bible into it. If you do science and it happens to correspond to your interpretation of the Bible, then bully for you. If not, then I don't care. Get a new interpretation or just get rid of the Bible. Those are the options open to you that don't make you dishonest. What's so important about dragon legends and old art that depicts an animal like a dinosaur? It's cool to look at. That's about it. But for some reason, I always forget that these morons actually think that bad medieval art of dragons is actual evidence for late surviving non-avian dinosaurs. And for no reason. It's just them being stupid for no particular reason. Just say that dinosaurs went extinct within a few decades of getting off the ark. Who cares? At least then you don't have to sit here and pretend that the story of St. George proves that Baryonyx was around in late antiquity Egypt, even though it's from England, or whatever they're about to say. Well, I start answering that question by trying to think about, okay, where would we look for evidence mm -hmm. if, if, if the Bible, if what the Bible suggests is right and true, 
that these dinosaurs lived in the relatively recent past, mm -hmm. thousands of years ago, went on Noah's Ark, lived with humans. I mean, that's really mm -hmm. weird to mm -hmm. most ears. Um, but that seems to be how you fit dinosaurs into the Bible's mm -hmm. historical time frame. That means that dinosaurs would have gone off the ark. Mm -hmm. And so where would we look for that evidence mm -hmm. that they may have lived uh, at the same time as people who lived way back then, thousands of years ago mm -hmm. after the flood? We'd look for physical remains, both in the wild, such as in caves or other areas where subfossils are found. And in terms of human interaction, we'd look for human middens and graves for physical evidence of dinosaurs whether that be in the form of remains of dinosaurs physically, or perhaps injuries caused by them, such as a human with a bite mark from one. Where we wouldn't look is old carvings that don't really look like dinosaurs, or the fanciful stories that include dragons, but also human-headed gods, ogres, and fairies. And you, the thing is, you would not look in fossils. Right. Because the fossils are a record of the flood. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so if you, look, if you find dinosaurs... Mm -hmm. In the flood rocks, those are the pre-flood dinosaurs that died in the flood, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and, and so... Well, here in reality land, they're simply too old to have lived with humans. But either way, yes, you shouldn't be looking earlier than the Holocene if you want to see evidence of humans interacting with non-avian dinosaurs. We don't see humans buried mm -hmm. with the dinosaurs. Which we should, by the way. Floods characteristically jumble organisms from many environments together into a big graded deposit. So if humans and dinosaurs were in the same flood, they should be in the same rocks. We don't see horses mm -hmm. or deer either. Which again is another point against the plausibility of the flood of Noah causing the fossil record. So there's like swamp creatures and lake creatures and mm -hmm. sea creatures buried with dinosaurs. And desert creatures and forest creatures. And oddly enough, we don't find modern swamp and lake creatures in many cases like beavers. Gee, I wonder why that is if we're going for ecological zonation. Why aren't swamp creatures like Dimetrodon and Castor being buried with wetland dinosaurs? Conversely, why aren't all the desert animals like desert foxes, Gorgonops, and Ceratosaurus all found together? Who knows? God just made it that way to look exactly like an impossible flood didn't happen, and exactly like evolution did happen over deep time. Mm -hmm. But there's no hard ground living creatures, so that's not the right mm -hmm. place to look right. for humans and dinosaurs coexisting if that's what we want to look. Yeah. This guy in this video already said that Cetacosaurus lived in a forest based on its coloration. He knows he's lying. There are dinosaurs that did not live in or particularly near water in the fossil record, and he knows it. But even without Cetacosaurus, we have many desert dwellers like Velociraptor, Protoceratops, Ceratosaurus, Coelophysis, etc. in the fossil record. Dinosaurs are not exclusively associated with wetlands. We also have dinosaurs that lived in the equivalent of prairies in many sauropods, who themselves probably kept the prairies from becoming forested by knocking down trees like modern elephants tend to. Except with much higher efficiency, because they were much bigger than elephants. You gotta lie to yek. And boy, is he just diving headfirst into that lie. But further, humans do live in swamps and wetlands. There are whole cultures that live primarily in swamps. Other than the extremes of the interior of exceptionally dry deserts and extremely cold places, there are no places on Earth where humans don't bother to settle in. There is no reason to think humans wouldn't have done so for their whole history. And that's all part of the flood record anyway. Yes. So you're looking at dinosaurs are wiped out at a certain level in the flood, and that's mm -hmm. what my research is showing. Okay. And then By my research is showing, of course, he means that is a conclusion I reached and then just scrabbled together whatever evidence I could find that didn't directly contradict that idea and ignored or lied about the rest. And above that, you have most of your common mammals like the horses and... So you got you're worried to expect to find humans. They're in, layers, mm -hmm. they're in flood layers, but they're way up. Way up above way the deep. dinosaurs. Interestingly, that's a matter of not inconsiderable disagreement among so-called flood geologists. Flood geologists, it kind of sounds like flat earth cartographer. Of course, they're not geologists because what they're doing isn't science, and geology is a science. But regardless, if there were an event as obvious, significant, and catastrophic as a global deluge, we wouldn't need much debate about which rocks are part of the record of that event. They would all be obvious. The reason they're not is that the fossil bearing rocks are just like rocks forming today. They include the same kind of rocks that we see form now in rivers, at the bottom of lakes, in moraines, in marine lagoons, in deserts, etc. There's no obvious place to put the flood because none of the rock looks like rock that could be easily assigned to such an event. So we get estimates of the flood boundary ranging from the end of the Carboniferous all the way up to the end of the Pleistocene. And every creationist has good reasons that every other option besides their own is impossible for the simple reason that they're all impossible, as every geologist who actually does geology could tell you. Uh, above the dinosaur layers. And in the post-flood world, you need 
to make a fossil, you got to have things buried fast and deep. Just faster than decay, which in many places is not very fast at all. And yes, fossils are forming today. Just look up subfossils, which are the remains of animals currently turning into permineralized fossils, but that have not yet completed that transformation. And that's the key. People forget you got to bury things fast and deep. And then it has to dewater pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it'll just... If it, if it's, right, it'll, it'll, it'll dissolve away. It'll dissolve mm -hmm. and rot. Fun fact, dissolving the original bone is part of the typical process of fossilization. That's why most fossils are actually rocks in the shape of bones, not the actual bones themselves. Uh, so, so the fact that we even have mm -hmm. a world full of continents mm -hmm. that have rock layers that have mm -hmm. fossils and uh, every continent has mm -hmm. dinosaur fossils mm -hmm. really is powerful evidence for the flood. That I you know, except for the part where nearly all of them are in rocks that are verifiably not flood deposits. But hey, who cares if a flood actually deposits flood deposits? Maybe magic Bible floods can deposit huge salt evaporites by evaporating underwater or something. Yeah, that's it. Coming back around to answering your question, where would we look for evidence mm -hmm. that humans and dinosaurs may have interacted in the past after the flood? It would be artifacts. Right. Right, like maybe a troodon tooth tipped arrowhead, or a stegosaur thagomizer club, or a crown made from the skull of a Utah raptor. Maybe someone using sauropod femurs to hold up their house or someone buried with a dinosaur skeleton that was a prized exotic pet, or as a sign of their strength as a hunter. Something like that would be pretty damn convincing. On the other hand, fantastical stories, or art that only vaguely looks like a dinosaur if you squint and really want it to look like one, would be really bad evidence. So let's see which kind of evidence we get, shall we? It'd be, it would be records. It would be artwork that mm -hmm. our ancestors mm -hmm. did. And I'm sure we're about to see some really cool, very accurate dinosaur art from the past that shows conclusively that medieval people were beset by Baryonyx, troubled by Tyrannosaurus, vexed by Velociraptor, hassled by Hadrosaurus, and afflicted by Apatosaurus, right? And so we have that on display, mm -hmm. some of it, just a taste, mm -hmm. here at the Discovery right Center. Right behind you, over right behind me, right. And so, boy, it's, it, now most dragon legend artwork is really is legendary. It's mm -hmm. like imaginary... Mm -hmm. creatures most of it is like well that's we don't know anything alive today that looks like that we don't know anything uh, extinct known from fossils mm -hmm. that looks like that it's almost like maybe we should look for artifacts that unambiguously include dinosaur remains or at least contemporary non-fossilized remains of dinosaurs instead of seeing what people scratched into rocks were painted onto the pages of tomes and in fact it looks like a hodgepodge of mm -hmm. bits and bobs of animal mm -hmm. parts that some artists cobbled together mm -hmm. you know for fun i mm -hmm. guess Still waiting for those examples. So that's not what we're talking about. That's not, those aren't really historical, actual creatures. Mm -hmm. But some of these, every once in a while, you find a diamond in the rough, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like, well, that's the exact anatomy mm -hmm. of what we know from fossils. That's right. And those are the interesting ones. And we do see written records, like even in the Bible. In the book of Job, we mm -hmm. see a description of Behemoth and Leviathan. Holy crap, I've covered this more times than I can count. Here's just me from the past talking about why neither Behemoth nor Leviathan and Job can be taken as evidence of late surviving dinosaurs. Um, it also says that uh, he lieth under the lotus tree. And so it's big. By the same time, though, it, it, it's not big enough like where it can't lie under the tree. It, if an Argentinosaurus were to try to do that, even while laying down, it would be impossible. It's, it's actually a little bit worse because the, the plants that it actually is, is said to, to hide in, in are reeds. You cannot hide a sauropod in reeds. I'm yeah. sorry, but the description puts an upper cap on the size limit, or off the size of this animal. It just cannot be a sauropod. And it also says how it, uh, it that doesn't say he has a tail that looks like a cedar tree. It's an action verb, not an adjective. Actually, the sauropod tr tails only look like American cedars. They don't look like Middle Eastern cedars, because those are different species. Yeah. I mean, a tail like a cedar, that'd be an enormous tail. Do you know many Bible commentaries, for instance, the NIV study Bible in the notes actually says this was a hippopotamus uh, or an elephant. Yeah, because both of those fit the description better and are known to have existed in the time and place or near the place where Job was most likely written. Whereas we have no physical evidence for sauropods. So tell you what, when you find a, you know, 3,000-year-old sauropod skeleton in the Middle East. Get back to me, Ken. 
And what what also says is that uh, Behemoth lives in the swamp, like which we know that uh, hippos definitely did. Uh, scientists thought that for a, a while that sauropods lived in the swamp, but from my understanding, that is no longer the consensus. Yeah, so the, the idea was originally that perhaps they were too heavy to survive uh, outside of water for very long, sort of like a hippo, which does have that problem. Um, but that is no longer the consensus. In fact, given how long their necks were, it's possible they may have even had trouble just breathing if they were in the water for too long. And also, uh, we have tracks of them in uh, in environments where there were not sufficient swamps or lakes for them to be surviving in. And it's also the fact that that they're they're extremely highly adapted to a uh, be large and terrestrial. They have what's called graviportal legs, which is a which is a leg that's adapted to carry enormous amounts of weight. So everything about a sauropod we now know is extremely clearly adapted to living on land and not spending a whole lot of time in the water. It's not to say they never went in the water, because virtually every animal ends up in the water, or ev animals of virtually every species end up in the water at some point. But a hippopotamus tail is like a little flap of skin. And, you know, an elephant's tail, it's like a piece of rope hanging in the wind. It's really difficult to know why uh, many commentators, even conservative commentators, are unwilling to take the descriptions in the book of Job about this, this creature and to try to apply them to a hippopotamus or some other animal when the description doesn't fit. It does fit, though. That's the thing. That's why they do it. In fact, the ol the part that's confusing as to why it goes back and forth between hippo and elephant is because the hiding among the reeds sounds like a hippo, but the nose-piercing snares sounds like an elephant. So that's the confusing bit. It's not clear and which one it fits better. And there's also no mention of a long neck, you know? Don't, don't you think that's a really odd thing to it's leave out about a sauropod? It is the most outstandingly unusual element of a sauropod, and yeah, there's there is no mention of it. What's about a sauropod? Uh, I suppose only they themselves know their motives, and, and the Lord uh, is it that they're afraid of looking foolish or you know scientifically simplistic or or whatever. But but it is very clear that the description of the the animal there in Job's uh, book is not a hippopotamus. When we look at this, the description of that creature. It really does seem to fit with a, a brachiosaur or a parasaurus, a sauropod type dinosaur. You read the description of Behemoth while looking at a fossil at, say, the Pittsburgh uh, Carnegie Mellon Museum of Natural History, and limbs like great bars of iron, you know. I mean, that's exactly the way it looks. Doesn't mean the bones were made out of iron. Also have to be big and strong bones too. Yeah, and the thing is, it's like, okay, yeah, I don't think anyone thinks that these bones are being literally described as being made of iron. So yeah, all you're saying there is it has big, strong bones. When your normal method of comparison is to say like humans or dogs or other, you know, like domesticated animals, then the bones of a hippo or an elephant are pretty substantial and strong. Nothing about this is indicative of a sauropod. It means they were just like great big bronze tubes and uh, iron tubes and uh, these big ribs, this immense belly, this big tail. I mean, we're clearly not describing a pussycat. No, I'll agree there. Uh, this fits uh, a dinosaur. Well, you know, Leviathan no. in Job 41 was not a dinosaur because technically the word dinosaur only refers to land animals. Hey, Ken Ham knows more about dinosaurs than Kent Hovind does, so give him that. Give so we could say a dinosaur-like creature, if you like, that lived in the sea. The Bible describes it as a dragon that lives in the sea. This thing is about the size of a school bus and weighed eight tons. And just as Leviathan is described as leaving a trail in the mud with, you know, potsherds, like, like shattered pieces of pottery. That's the sort of trail that a crocodile makes in the mud. But you're not talking about the crocodile that we know nowadays. If you look at this picture of a modern day crocodile skull and uh, this sarcosuchus skull around it, you can see the vast difference in size. Okay, like, and? yeah, right. Like, do you have evidence that sarcosuchus was around? I mean, at that time? Sarcosuchus went extinct a long time ago. I mean, long, I mean, uh, and yeah, like long, long before, you know, the book of Job was written. Now, would it be cool? Yeah, but what else don't realize is that a lot of the crocodiles around now and even the crocodiles around during Job's day, I mean, to us, they were still pretty big. It's like, so yeah. what if they weren't big, Sarkasuk? It's like, still to us, still pretty darn big. 
I'm going to say, uh, so Energy by the Bithen says, yes, there actually is a mention of a sail as in a shield on its back. Here's a problem, though. Uh, I think shield on its back is a much better description of bony scutes, which crocodilians have, and dinosaurs are only a small subset of, or a couple of small subsets of, of them are known to have any significant scutes, and uh, Spinosaurus was not in that group, so Spinosaurus probably didn't have any scutes, so... Yeah. But yeah, and uh, the uh, the consensus from scholars is that Leviathan is just talking about a, a, a Nile crocodile. It's because if that's what, what was around, you know, at that time and in that area. Right. And and a lot of them will just say that it, 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 it's just written like in a very poetic, uh, poetic and ex exaggerated way of a crocodile. Like, think of it kind of like when you talk about mother nature well there's also the case that leviathan is mentioned elsewhere in the psalms when god is described as killing it and there's a fair chance that leviathan is actually based on the primordial dragon of the sea that you find in a lot of uh middle eastern ancient mythologies so there's also that possibility and it truly fits the description in the book of job where it talks about how you know this sort of creature will just shrug off harpoons and arrows and 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 laugh at fish hooks and things like this <laughs> And also, uh, the book of Job describes as if it has rows of shields closely interlocking with no space between them. And it's interesting that the um, uh, description of Sarcosuchus includes the many scoots that have been found, and these are like the big scale. But also that's true for every crocodilian, so... And they are closely overlocking, and they're about one foot in diameter, these shields on... Uh, Leviathan. It says it, he breathed fire. Now when people look at that, they say, well, now we know the Bible can't be trusted because that's just a mythical creature breathing fire. I say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who says animals can't breathe fire? Find an example of an animal breathing fire. I mean, or find evidence that any animal did. Well, he's going to bring up, I know he's going to bring the bomb bitter beetle, but that's, I mean, it does breathe out like some sort of smoke from its rear end, but it's still not fire. It's not. And the thing is, it requires very specific modifications to the anatomy, which in a beetle can be fairly cryptic because all the soft anatomy is on the inside. But that's not the case for, you know, tetrapods. This kind of anatomy should be something that we would actually see some evidence for. Because a dinosaur doesn't have a lot of extra space to have sacks full of flammable chemicals. So I mean, it should have some skeletal mark that there were such things. I mean, we think about it. it. Yeah. We have a little beetle called a bombardier beetle. There it is. That can mix chemicals like hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide together and blast out hot gases at 212 degrees Fahrenheit to put a frog off its lunch. If you look at uh, the electric eel, the ability to electrocute. You look at the spitting comer that uses a huge gust of air from its lungs. No one is arguing that animals can't use projectile weapons. It's not the argument anyone's making. But the huge d d difference is an eel and a corva do not spit off fire. Right. Well, and the thing is, is like, okay, well, let's say that the dragon breathing fire is a legendary exaggeration of some more likely process, like spitting venom or spitting some hot chemical, you know, liquid chemicals. Okay, great. But then that means that any of the other aspects of dragons that you think make them look like dinosaurs can also be exaggerations on some non-dinosaur animal. So it means that you cannot take these legends seriously as accurate descriptions of animals. So it's kind of a self-defeating point to make, but okay. To really create an aerosol type effect for its venom that shoots out and will hit the eyes of, of uh, you know attackers or, or enemies. You start looking at some of these things, you're like, okay, can is it possible that these eyewitness accounts really did have some evidence behind them? Interestingly, the uh, snout of Sarcosuchus had a bulla, some sort of a hollow cavity of some sort at the tip that nobody knows exactly what it was for. He is trying to argue how because of the skull looks it therefore it breathed fire. Right. So basically I think the point is like, okay, so there's this little notch near the where I think it's near where the premaxilla interfaces with the maxilla. So you're saying that Sarcosuchus had flammable chemicals in fleshy pouches dangling from the bottom of its mouth. I guess I can't say it's impossible, but it seems like a very bad plan. I would Mixing say so. of chemicals or some sort of a chamber, uh, some sort of a chemical storage mm. chamber for generating the, the fire and smoke that the um, uh, Book of Job also describes concerning Leviathan. When you get to the post-flood world, without those conditions to bury them, you're not gonna get uh, fossils or really of anything. I'm going to need a citation for that one. You don't see fossils. You see some Ice Age fossils, 
My dinosaurs didn't live near the ice. Tell that to you, Tyrannus, Pachyrhinosaurus, Antarctopelta, Morosaurus, Trinosaurus, and Edmontosaurus. All dinosaurs that lived in polar regions that experienced annual freezes and snowfall during the Cretaceous. Oh, but we're pretending the dinosaurs were scaly, cold-blooded animals, not feathery, warm-blooded ones like we now know them to be. Okay, I guess just more reality denial from Team YEC. They had to have warmer climates, I believe. Yeah, you do believe that because you're either an idiot talking outside of his field, or you're a liar. Feel free to let me know which one it is. And so they were living far from where the ice sheets were and where the sediments were being deposited from these catastrophic melting even of the ice. And so you don't have dinosaurs as fossils in the post-flood world. Okay, but we have extensive aurochs remains from Great Britain, almost all of Europe except for northern Scandinavia, North Africa, the Near East, the Middle East, the Levant, Southwest Asia, Northern China, and Siberia, as well as the Indian subcontinent. They were large herbivores that were about what we've heard was the average size of a dinosaur. So why do we have remains of these animals that went extinct in the 17th century from the millennia throughout history prior to that, but not a single non-avian dinosaur skeleton from that time? Aurochs remains aren't generally fossilized, so even if the lie that fossilization doesn't happen anymore were true, it wouldn't matter. This is recent enough for the original bones to be found. We have accounts and trophies from aurochs hunts. Why do we not have such from stegosaur or ankylosaur or heterodontosaur hunts? Maybe, and stick with me now, just maybe, it's because there were no such animals living with the humans, ever. Because the whole story this is based on is obviously not literally true. And you wouldn't expect it. <clears throat> I wouldn't expect it either, <laughs> and yeah, we don't have... Yeah, I agree. Except, you know, we should expect to find remains of such large animals as well as unambiguous art. We have exquisite cave art from all over the place of animals like European lions, aurochs, horses, etc. Things that modern scientists have even used to reconstruct the life appearances of recently extinct animals from places like Europe and the Middle East. Why is this not the case for dinosaurs? Or is it, and these two are just holding out on us for effect? Mm -hmm. But it's this artwork, it's mm -hmm. really interesting, and we've got... We've got artwork that, I mean, one of the interesting pieces of art that I that, that I've encountered is, for example, in Barcelona, there's an altar piece um, from the Middle Ages. Okay, so the Middle Ages is from the late fifth century to about the fifteenth century, a period of some thousand years. Let's see what we can learn about this altar piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, it shows. Uh, a depiction of St. George and the Dragon. St. George, okay. not sure if he existed, but let's pretend he did. There's no good reason to be particularly skeptical about the existence of St. George. He was an ethnically Greek Roman legionary who was killed for refusing to recant his Christianity during the Diocletian persecution in the year AD 303. Nothing about that is extraordinary. And the dragon legend doesn't come into the picture attached to him until the 11th century. So while that certainly didn't happen, he's very likely a real person who lived and died for his religious faith. I find it odd that these two will maintain skepticism for the completely mundane assertion that a soldier named George was killed by the Roman state for being a Christian at a time when that was a known thing that happened to plenty of people. But they take quite seriously the idea that maybe dinosaurs were roaming the land when he would have lived. A far more extraordinary claim. Whoever did that art had to choose some kind of anatomy to represent the dragon. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that this particular artist chose a very unique anatomy, mm -hmm. not known from other St. George and the Dragon depictions, mm -hmm. which are all over Europe. But this one's unique, and it's got these teeth that go outside the mouth. Mm -hmm. So when it closes yeah. its mouth, teeth are outside. And um, the length of its legs to body mm -hmm. ratio, the whole body length in proportion to St. George on a horse, it's all exactly precise from what we know from fossils mm -hmm. of Nothosaurus, yeah, it's exactly like Nothosaurus, except, you know, for the placement of the nostrils, the number of toes, the vertical positioning of the legs, the curlicue tail, and the fact that the animal in the drawing has mammalian ears. Other than that, sure, it's just like a Nothosaurus. Which, by the way, isn't a dinosaur. It's more closely related to a turtle than to a dinosaur. Weird how the artist, presumably having seen humans, horses, and Nothosaurus, would get so much wrong on the Nothosaurus. Or maybe, given the mammalian ears on this guy, this is just another one of those fanciful chimeras. Which, you know, it is. P.S. The jaw shape is also wrong. The dentary of Nothosaurus dips eventually, starting at the posterior end, before rising dorsally again about two-thirds of the way along the length of the bone. The teeth are not uniform in size, with only the anteriormost teeth being the large ones that would likely have poked out of the mouth. 
In short, if this is a Nothosaurus, it's a really crappy depiction of one, which is surprising given how accurate the horse is right down to the limb musculature. Okay. Which is in rock layers below the dinosaur rocks. Mm -hmm. But what we've been saying all along is that the flood deposited mm -hmm. the dinosaur rocks and the layers below it. Correct. And the, all these layers were deposited mm -hmm. in just one year. Mm -hmm. And we've been, we've been saying that, mm -hmm. believing that for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that not just the dinosaurs, but the... Um, but these other extinct reptiles mm -hmm. would have gone on board the Ark too. Except that according to ICR, Nothosaurus would not have been on the Ark because it wasn't a land animal, it was a Sauropterygian. They were a group of aquatic reptiles that included the Plesiosaurs. Why would it be on the Ark? Did Noah also take whales on the Ark? And even mammal-like mm -hmm. reptiles that we see buried in rock layers sometimes mm -hmm. above uh, dinosaurs. So, Breaking news! Modern synapsid thinks that synapsids living with dinosaurs is somehow controversial. So when we see artwork that looks like, oh, the, the, this creature lived, mm -hmm. this creature lived right on through uh, up until the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. you know, because someone knew the exact anatomy. I would love to see such artwork, but so far I got something that doesn't look like a nothosaur and has mammal ears. This is not exactly compelling. In many of the depictions, they actually have the legs coming straight down. Like you talked about at the very beginning for dinosaurs, yeah, dinosaurs. for these dragons. For some of these dragons and things, you see many of them have their legs coming straight down. Yeah, all the an anatomy really And works. so, you know, people, if they were doing reptiles today, they would draw them sprawling. Okay, but Nothosaurus should have had sprawling hind limbs at least, and that art didn't. So, I'm not seeing the consistency here. Maybe some examples of these cool erect limb dragons is in order. All right, the, kind of the second part of that question is, who in the Bible may have actually seen or interacted with dinosaurs? Any biblical character who existed would have seen and probably interacted in some way with birds. I don't care about their opinion on this, so we're moving on. Good dinosaurs or flying reptiles spit fire. I don't know for certain if any animals ever breathed fire, but there's absolutely no reason to think that any of them did. So until actual physical evidence of such an animal is presented, the conclusion I must reach is to say that they almost certainly did not breathe fire. Like in the in the Job 41, it talks about Leviathan and you know, like the flying reptiles fiery flying mm -hmm. serpent in, in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, we know what a fiery flying serpent is in the context of Biblical Hebrew because we have carvings of them from the time and place of the writing of the text. They were four-winged cobras. So unless ICR wants to show us a fossil cobra with four bird wings attached, this is dumb. So so, so we do have bioluminescence mm -hmm. and we even have sea creatures are of course, mm -hmm. lots of sea creatures make their own light, even sharks. Mm -hmm glow, uh, have their bellies glow. Well, no known tetrapod has bioluminescence, so unless these two chuckleheads can find one, this doesn't really explain away the fire breathing. Also, while there are some bioluminescent sharks, it's not exactly a trait of all sharks. So bioluminescence is mm -hmm. really awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, it shows us that God can build a, you know, a living structure that can make its own light. Why couldn't he build, we also have electric eels mm -hmm. showing God can build biological structures mm -hmm. that shoot out electricity, why not have one that shoots fire? Right. I don't know, maybe because the inside of tetrapod mouths aren't very fireproof? Something you might know if you ever ate a pizza that was too hot and burned that ridge just behind the front of your teeth? Also, cool hypothetical, but there's no evidence for it, is there? And that's what we have in Job 41 with Leviathan. It's a it's a sea dragon type thing that, sh that, sh that could uh, breathe fire. Um, that's what the text says. Mm -hmm. And for us to say, no, it couldn't do that, is for us to pretend like mm -hmm. we were there mm -hmm. and we have some kind of observational evidence against what the eyewitnesses right. wrote down for us. They knew they were there. Um, God can do it, and so I believe it. Ah, so the evidence is that it's just an interpretation of a book that he likes. There isn't any actual physical or historical evidence. Just, I think my book says it's totally real, so I think it's totally real. Neat, but clearly everyone can see that that's not science. It's just will to believe. This goes back to that story that in the previous chapter, Job 41, about behemoth eating grass. Nope, we're not going back to behemoth. Physical evidence or get the f*** out, boys. He talks a bit about dinosaurs eating grass. Yep, some did. It's not important because, oh no, emergence time of grass has been revised. Yeah, science changes. How long could dinosaurs live, do you think? Uh, I think we disagree on this one. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> we don't always agree, but most, most things. 
This is like asking how long mammals live. Some mammals die of old age after barely a year. Others can last more than a century. Some dinosaurs probably lived fast and died young. Others, like giant sauropods, might have been able to make it to a century. How long do you think they could live? Did they live longer before the flood? That's kind of the well, here's, question. Here's the bottom line answer is, we don't have any living dinosaurs mm -hmm. to measure mm -hmm. how big they grow, how fast mm -hmm. they grew. And some might have, may have grown faster mm -hmm. in different circumstances. On the one hand, it's true that we don't have any living non-avian dinosaurs to test, and that lifespan varies so much in any fairly wide taxon that we can't draw conclusions just from living dinosaurs. But there are options, such as histology on bones, that can give us some ideas about the growth patterns and longevity, since as a rule of thumb, animals that grow up fast tend to also not live as long as those who grow up slowly. For example, mice are sexually mature in less than a year, but that's because they tend not to live many years. On the other hand, elephants and humans are very slow to reach sexual maturity, and both are very long-lived species. So in 2007, the bone histology of Platyosaurus was studied. In 2013, the same was done for Cetacosaurus, and in 2000, the same for Myosauro. In the Platyosaurus, it was found that it grew very quickly, but it's a bit early to conclude that this means a short life. Sauropods may have had a life history similar to that of sea turtles, who can live up to 50 years if they make it to adulthood, which they do quickly if they do it at all. And I say that because they lay many eggs, very few of which result in adults. These eggs are abandoned after being laid and the mother just goes back into the ocean. Sauropods seem to have done something similar, although with no ocean. Cetacosaurus seems to have been a more modest grower, taking some five years to reach adulthood, and interestingly, switching from being quadrupedal to bipedal while growing up, which is something humans do as well. For this organism, it could probably last a couple decades if it's lucky, as adult lifespan is usually at least a few times the time typically spent as a juvenile. Myosaurus matured quite quickly, spending only a couple of months or so in a nest and reaching adult size in at most two years. So despite their size, perhaps Myosaurus was in the live fast, die young category. But let's see how disappointing the answer from the creationists is, now that we've actually looked into actual dinosaur science. Also, these three examples come from the papers that are linked in the description. Um, maybe the males grew faster mm -hmm. and bigger, and the females mm -hmm. not so much, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So This is generally pretty unlikely. Both sexes almost certainly hit sexual maturity at about the same age, as otherwise some juveniles would require more parental care in those species that provided it, or would spend significantly longer in vulnerable juvenile stages in those species that did not provide significant parental care. Further, except in species with large amounts of sexual dimorphism, this just doesn't generally occur. For example, humans are only mildly sexual dimorphic, and juvenile humans of both sexes grow at about the same rate overall until reaching their puberty growth spurt, which is generally the last phase of physical growth of the long bones in humans. It's only the difference in the timing of this, with females generally hitting the growth spurt earlier than males, that results in the ultimate average height differences between sexes in humans. It also results in the fact that for a few years, juvenile females tend to be taller than juvenile males in humans before the males hit their growth spurt and on average overtake their female peers. Anyway, there's no particularly good reason to think that growth differs significantly between sexes and dinosaurs, and most dinosaur species aren't known to have two morphs that likely represent sexual dimorphism. Although an exception is Tyrannosaurus rex, which has a robust morph and a gracile morph. Interestingly, only the robust morphs have been shown to be female, and so it's quite possible that the robust T-rex were female and the gracile T-rex were male, although this is not conclusive. There's a lot of unknowns, yeah. so I think we're really moving into the realm of right. speculation. And, and some experts who look at the, um, they look at osteons, which are these bone structures inside the bone, microscopic structures. Mm -hmm. So you cut the bone, mm -hmm. thin section it, look at the microscope. Oh, look at there's these rings. It's like growth mm -hmm. rings on a tree. Mm -hmm. And they say, because there's five rings here, this must be a five-year-old dinosaur. But for every guy who says that, there's mm -hmm. another guy or gal who says, mm -hmm. no, that's a two-year-old or that's a 10-year-old. Mm -hmm. And it's just that the pattern here mm -hmm. is different than the actual age. And so it's just so debated that I don't it's not really a hill I want to die on. Well, I think the histological studies are far less controversial than we're being told, but yes, it's not easy, even with such studies, to say conclusively about the full life histories of dinosaurs. One great thing that can happen in the life history of humans is that they can subscribe to this channel. So if you haven't already and you're enjoying this video, why not go ahead and do that? You can even turn on notifications. Don't worry, it's free and you can undo it. Well, I think the really small ones, I think maybe you're know, somewhat accurate on them. You know, they can see a couple growth rings. And as they got bigger, if you can find enough of them, that's the part of the problem is you, you can't find enough of a, of a package from hatchling all the way to large adult size. There's only a few dinosaur species where they can actually kind of do that to some respects.
But they do see a pattern. But eventually, other people, other experts in paleontology have said that at a certain point, you don't, you no longer get rings. And so they're really just minimum ages. Yep. After reaching adult size, it seems that bone ring development can halt, indicating that dinosaurs were determinate growers, unlike many lizards and crocodilians. After this point, it's very hard to determine the absolute age of a dinosaur. You need to use proxies like bone pathologies, which tend to accumulate during life. But even then, there are animals that can be especially unlikely and break many bones, while an older animal has not broken any. In mammals, you can use tooth wear as a proxy for determining age, but dinosaurs replace their teeth frequently throughout their life, so this doesn't help either. Unfortunately, this is probably just one of the areas we will never know much about. Although, if you'd asked me about dinosaur coloration 15 years ago, I'd have said the same thing. And I was wrong about that, so who knows? After this, they just agree with me, so we'll skip that. I don't want to use too much of their footage. That would violate fair use. Next, though, we're going to hear something about gigantism as a defense mechanism in sauropods. And while that was certainly an advantage, let's just hear what comes next. Certainly true with sauropods. Right. Because they didn't have armor plating. No. They didn't have... I would like to formally introduce you to the sauropod family, Saltosauridae, named for the type species Saltosaurus. They were known for their extensively bony dermal armor. Now, it's true that armored sauropods were restricted to this family as far as we know, but that means you can't just say that sauropods weren't armored. I think they continue to grow bigger. There's, there's conflicting evidence on that, but many reptiles today seem to keep growing bigger. There's some they say reach a determinate size. Yes, like all modern dinosaurs, dinosaurs, as we've already discussed, were probably determinate growers. And that gets into the whole warm-blooded, cold-blooded thing. You know, and I lean to the side of dinosaurs being cold-blooded. That's because, Dr. Clary, you are an idiot, whether intentionally or not. Those same histological studies that I mentioned earlier show that dinosaurs almost certainly grew too fast to be ectotherms, or cold-blooded. As many dinosaurs, especially theropods, are built for high-speed lifestyles that are incompatible with ectothermy and demand at least mesothermy, if not endothermy, or warm-bloodedness. Further, dinosaurs from a huge range of dinosauria had feathers and protofeathers. It's hard to see why, if not for insulation, something only endotherms really need. But continue on with your reality denial, Dr. Clary. This isn't any more absurd than the flood story, which according to your own models, would turn the Earth into a new sun with all the heat released. To me, it makes more sense why they went extinct ultimately after the flood, because the climate was different in the pre-flood world. It was a little colder areas, much more harsh. Well, as we've discussed, dinosaurs from sauropods to theropods to ceratopsians to ornithopods managed to do just fine in the snow in the Cretaceous. I'm sorry if that makes it hard for you to rationalize your absurd ideas about the Earth being 740,000 times younger than it really is, but frankly, that's your problem, not mine, Dr. Clary. There might have even been changes to the amount of CO2 and oxygen in the atmosphere, and that's debatable as well. But a lot of those things could have happened during the flood as you're making limestone, pulling things out of the air. To make calcium carbonate, you've got to pull CO2 out of the air, and so there could have been a big change in the atmosphere. Oh, the flood corresponded with an impossibly explosive growth and die-off of marine phytoplankton? Because that's basically what limestone is made up of. The skeletons of tiny photosynthetic plankton. And of course, limestone just doesn't deposit in such a flood. Because it needs calm water. You know, being made from plankton primarily. The skeletons in question precipitate very slowly, and Brownian motion in water can easily overcome the force of gravity on such particles. I look forward to the experiments and simultaneous population explosion in phytoplankton and high-energy limestone deposition that I'm sure are just around the corner from the Institute of Creation Research. Until then, though, sorry, but extensive limestone formations absolutely preclude the flood of Noah as understood by ICR on their own. Uh, in the pre-flood and post-flood world, uh, I think too often we make the flood too small. Well, that might just be because we know that a flood as big as young Earth creationists want absolutely did not happen. Since that's the case, minimizing its effects makes it less implausible, as does limiting its extent. You know, it actually affected the atmosphere, I believe, the crust, not just the sediments, not just the fossils. Things were completely changed from the pre-flood to the post-flood, and that affected how dinosaurs, and if they were cold budded which I think there's strong evidence to support that. We're just not going to be provided with that evidence. And let's be real, the evidence is that it would be convenient for Dr. Perry if dinosaurs were cold-blooded. That's it. Unfortunately for him, there's actually strong evidence that dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and even the ancestors of crocodilians were all originally warm-blooded, as are modern dinosaurs. And even modern crocodilians retain the four-chambered heart of a warm-blooded reptile, although they bypass one of the chambers, resulting in a structural four-chambered heart that is functionally three-chambered. And they are cold-blooded today. Which actually is an interesting question. Why would the designer take a four-chambered warm-blooded heart, stick it in a cold-blooded animal, and then bypass one of the chambers? 
Why not just give crocodilians the lizard hearts they could just as easily have had? There's no good reason. The only reason is that crocodilians evolved from warm-blooded ancestors who needed a four-chambered heart. How they could have survived in the post-flood world. They had a much more limited range of where they could live, you know, the equatorial regions. Snakes are among the most widespread cold-blooded reptiles, and since we're talking about what Clary is pretending are cold-blooded dinosaurs, they're not the worst proxy. They're found as far north as Scandinavia and as far south as southern Argentina and Chile and Tasmania. That's far outside the tropics. Plus, unlike snakes, dinosaurs had fluff to keep them warm in many cases. This idea simply doesn't hold water. Nothing about the modern climate would preclude dinosaurs. And let's not forget that in the real world, dinosaurs today range across literally every landmass on Earth, including the coast of Antarctica. They couldn't live up in the Great North, especially right after the flood when there was an ice age, they would have had to force them further south uh, from where the Ark landed. And they would have had to live in these climates you know, a little tough climates for them to survive in, and so many animals today even go extinct. Ah, the poor arctic tern. The dinosaur that cannot live in cold environments, despite spending basically its whole life within the polar regions of the world. Granted, it does so in local summer, but still. And if we need a more extreme example, how about, you know, penguins. Famously well adapted in most cases to the coldest landmass on Earth, Antarctica. Maybe if we couldn't just look around and see dinosaurs doing just fine at the actual coldest place on Earth, this would make more sense. You know, because of the long-term climate change, long-term, you know, their vegetation that they ate is being wiped out. And it isn't always caused by humans. It's, you know, of course, we push the envelope. We might have helped push the envelope on the dinosaurs as well. Modern climate change is almost entirely caused by human activity. And without such activity, the Earth would probably be heading for another glacial expansion. As it is, humans are in the process of entirely ending the Ice Age, and doing so in record times in terms of the history of climate change on Earth. This is not something that's actually under any debate in the scientific community. It's quite conclusive. The driving cause of climate change is atmospheric carbon dioxide, and the majority source of introducing that chemical into the atmosphere is human burning of fossil fuels. It is absolutely a problem, and unfortunately there are not a lot of easy solutions. But there are people working on it, and we have avoided the worst case scenarios that were projected a decade or so ago. But we're far from out of the woods on that. We need to expand renewable and nuclear power sources. There aren't other actual options. We can't physically plant enough trees to make a dent. No amount of your personally reducing your carbon footprint is going to make the change. We need to restructure the power production of every major economy in the world. Period. Uh, but ultimately, I believe they went, they went extinct. They were diminishing in number because the conditions after the flood were so different than before the flood. But they were around for a long, long time. And the only evidence of that we were presented with was a relief from a Spanish altar that even they don't think depicts a dinosaur and definitely doesn't accurately depict the animal they said it was. You'll have to forgive me if I find that entirely uncompelling. How can you say they were not warm-blooded? Good question. In fact, one of the dinosaurs already mentioned by these two bozos was Cynoceropteryx. We have numerous unambiguous fossils containing insulating filaments in dinosaurs as well as histological studies that indicate rapid metabolic rates consistent with endothermy. So let's see if we get anything to indicate cold-bloodedness beyond just that dinosaurs are reptiles and it's convenient to their story for them to be cold-blooded. Because they have to be warm-blooded in order to evolve into birds. No, dinosauri as a whole does not need to be warm-blooded in order for a subset to evolve into warm-blooded birds. All that's needed is for that subset to be warm-blooded sometime before the emergence of crown aves. And then, bam, birds are ancestrally warm-blooded. That endothermy appears to be the basal trait in the wider archosauria is basically a coincidence. Now, we do know that most dinosaurs were probably at least mesothermic, which is basically the midway between warm and cold-blooded, and many were certainly full endotherms. Which we know dinosaurs <laughs> evolved into birds, right? Well, that's the story they're, they're spreading now in the secular the world. The dinosaurs were birds. No one says f Triceratops was a bird. Saying dinosaurs are birds is like saying mammals are humans. It's beyond stupid. It betrays a complete misunderstanding of the most basic aspects of taxonomy. The level of taxonomy a toddler can understand. Vice versa. There you go. Vice versa. And the thing is, it's true. Birds meet every definition of dinosaur. And of course, you know what's not about to happen? It's that they're not going to give us a good definition of dinosaur and then truthfully show us how birds fail to meet it. I know that won't happen because that's impossible but it's also what they'd actually need to do to claim that birds aren't dinosaurs. And it's what no creationist ever does. But further, they could just admit that birds are dinosaurs. It doesn't actually change anything about their position. They accept that whales are mammals, so why not accept that birds are dinosaurs? 
There's really no reason except that they've been planting a flag on this hill for decades and they'll be darned if they're going to retreat from it now, even if the hill provides no tactical advantage whatsoever. I'm like, we disagree with that totally here at ICR. Cool. You can disagree with reality all you want. It just makes you wrong. And hey, you're allowed to be wrong. In fact, I think that the right to be wrong is one of the most important rights there is. It's basically the same as the right to freedom of belief and conscience. But I also have a right to correct you and to mock you for being so obviously silly. That's like that's like the yeah. professor who told mm -hmm. the students, you're a fish, mm -hmm. whether you're just a highly evolved fish, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. Yeah. You know, that's a quote yeah. from the textbook. I would love to know which textbook that quote is supposedly taken from. But let's talk about being fish. So fish isn't a taxon. It's basically what we call aquatic vertebrates with gills, but some of those are more closely related to you than they are to other fish. All bony fish are more closely related to humans than they are to sharks or stingrays. And all lungfish are more closely related to humans than they are to any non-lungfish fish. So if we wanted to use fish to mean anything taxonomically and keep all the animals we currently call fish still called that, then fish basically just means vertebrate, and humans are certainly vertebrates. Now this isn't the venue for a full discussion of the transition of aquatic fish to tetrapod on land, but I'll recommend the book Your Inner Fish by Neil Shubin. It's an excellent book that covers not only the fossil record of the transition from basal lobe fish to tetrapod, but also covers the deep physical and genetic homologies that show how every part of human anatomy is a modified part of the anatomy found in fish, and not just lobe fish or even bony fish, but even skates, rays, and sharks. Uh, it, it, it's like, yeah, this is so imaginary that what world are we living in? Uh, yeah, you because know, you know, fish are different than people. Ah, uh, yes. Personal incredulity. The retreat of someone who has no actual objection, but doesn't want to sound too mean. Hey, Dr. Thomas, you saying something in a joking and incredulous tone of voice isn't an argument. If you want to give an argument as to why taxonomically humans aren't vertebrates, I'll hear it out. And if you want to debate the genetic homologies between all vertebrates, I'll hear it. And if you want to dispute the fossil record of transitional stem tetrapod, I'll hear that too. But what I'm actually hearing is none of that. Instead, I'm just hearing you say, nah, bro, I'm not buying it. Which, you know, isn't an argument. Right. And it, there, there is actually uh, fossil evidence to support the cold-bloodedness. There's, you know, you look, the people have studied the skulls of dinosaurs, different types of dinosaurs, and they show there's no, these turbinates, these things that warm the air as you breathe in, that most mammals have. Oh, man. But not all mammals, because they're more important in the cold, and not all mammals live in the cold but they're still endotherms. But further, these turbinates are often paper thin in both birds and mammals. And remember, birds are dinosaurs and paper thin sheets of bone are unlikely to fossilize. But beyond that, we do have non-avian dinosaur turbinates in the fossil record. We have evidence for turbinates in Ceratosaurus, yeah, me, and Eoplocephalus. And since those are basically on opposite ends of the dinosaur family tree, we can say with pretty good confidence that turbinates were probably common throughout Dinosauria. Dinosaurs didn't have those things. Uh, you are a rotten liar. Even their eggs, they took longer to hatch than you know most birds and most warm-blooded animals. Their eggs have been shown to take you know months, several months to hatch, similar like crocodiles and, and alligators do. Oh, but the eggs of the Mali fowl, the Poa ocellata of Australia, typically take 62 days to hatch and can take up to 90 days. That counts as months. And the eggs of emus take 46 to 56 days. That's always over a month, and in some cases, just shy of two months. And let me check my notes. Uh, ah, yes, emus and mallee fowl are indeed warm-blooded birds. Heck, the royal albatross, Diomedia epifemora, lays eggs that take almost three months to hatch at about 80 days of incubation. So, sorry, Dr. Clary, but I have to call bull on this being a difference between dinosaurs and birds. Plus, what part of the definition of dinosaur or birds depends on incubation period? Oh, is it no part? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And so is, there's uh, quite a bit of evidence, you know, scientific bone evidence to support that they were cold-blooded. We just don't get to hear about it, I guess. It's just become popular since the 60s and 70s to push dinosaurs being warm-blooded. Yeah, since that's when unambiguously active pursuit predators were really described with things like Deinonychus. I'm sorry that science doesn't just jump the gun and conclude things without evidence. Oh wait, no I'm not sorry, because that's how it's supposed to work. Science has only known about special relativity for about 120 years. But I guess since that isn't the beginning of time, satellites just don't work. Oh wait, yes they do, you unthinking dunderhead. It doesn't matter when a discovery was made. If tomorrow we found a fossil of a fully feathered sauropod, then guess what that would mean? At least some of them had feathers all along, and we just didn't know it. There would be no use in saying, Oh, but people only started arguing for feathery sauropods in 2022. 
Yeah, that's when in the scenario we got that evidence. I don't know if you can tell, dear audience, but this video is really getting on my nerves. And then to go back to the old 19th century idea of dinosaurs are birds. And now you're seeing people out there saying dinosaurs had feathers and... Yeah, you know, like the unambiguous feathers on animals like Colindodromius, Microraptor, and Eutyranus, as well as the ones that these idiots mentioned, Cynoceropteryx. We say dinosaurs had feathers for the same reason we say they had claws. The anatomy is right there for all to see. And uh, I'll, maybe I'll let you kick on that one. That's one of the questions coming up. Were dinosaurs, in fact, yeah, we'll did they have about. feathers? You know, were they warm-blooded and did they have feathers? But before I let, let you go on that, to make a dinosaur into a bird, you got to first make them warm-blooded. Already done. It's the basal condition for Inithodirons, which is dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and their close relatives. And it is probably the basal condition for Archosauria as a whole. And remember, we were given literally no reason to doubt this. And so I think that's the first step that they took in the 70s and 80s. They started pushing dinosaurs were warm-blooded, even though the evidence is not strong. You know what? I'm not above reusing a meme. There's some evidence to support, you know, there are some similarities between certain types of dinosaurs and birds. Yeah, like the semilunate carpal in Manoraptorans, the increasingly reduced tail and increasingly horizontal posture of the femur in Eumanoraptorans, the loss of teeth and the presence of beaks in avialans, and the arrival of the picostyle in the well-named picostylia, etc, etc. And of course, this is ignoring that the closer you get to birds in terms of skeletal anatomy, the more the feathers resemble those of modern birds. And by the time you get to Manoraptora, which includes animals like Oviraptorosaurs and Dromaeosaurs, they're basically just fully modern feathers. But there's a lot that they disregard, the evidence that really supports, I think, that dinosaurs are not related to birds at all. It would be great to hear some of that evidence. At least toss out the creationist favorite discredited paleoornithologist, Alien Fiducia, or one of his pals like Lingam Soliar. But the cold-blooded evidence, I think, is still strong. And so, but they don't want to hear about that. Yes, I do. I'm literally asking for it right here, right now. I want to hear about it. I just haven't. The closest I've heard is that dinosaur eggs on average take a few months to incubate, which is just a nothing argument. Yeah, that's now heresy in the secular world to talk about dinosaurs being cold-blooded. Nope, it's not heresy. It's just dumb. There's no such thing as heresy in science. There are things that are supported by evidence, like the great age of the Earth, evolution, and the fact that birds are dinosaurs, and the fact that the Earth is a globe, and there are things that are not supported by evidence, like that the Earth is 6,000 years old, special creation, birds not being dinosaurs, and the flat Earth. Those latter things are not taken seriously in science because there's no reason to think they're true, and excellent reasons to think they're false. Even though there's a lot of evidence that's out there, if you dig through the evidence, and I did this for a lab and I taught at a uh, public college, I looked through, I said, okay, what's the evidence for cold-blooded? What's the evidence for warm-blooded? And I found there's a lot of evidence in the bones, like the turbinates, lack of turbinates and things, to show that dinosaurs very well could have been cold-blooded. And that's a big problem if you're trying to turn them into birds. Weird how at least some dinosaurs did have turbinates. Turbinates aren't required to be warm-blooded. Not all mammals even have respiratory turbinates. Yeah, because to, to, do, to do that transformation, mm -hmm. you have to reorganize like mm -hmm. all the organs, all the organ systems, the cells, mm -hmm. uh, because... Because um, of... Uh, what? What does it even mean that you have to reorganize the organs and cells? What do you think, birds have their lungs in their feet or something? Are their muscle cells push instead of pull cells like in all other animals? What are we talking about? And even proteins, specific individual mm -hmm. proteins mm -hmm. within cells. Oh, I was unaware that Dr. Thomas has an extensive list of protein sequences for non-avian dinosaurs to compare to bird sequences. But also, isn't it interesting that when Dr. Schweitzer found molecular fossil remnants of T. rex collagen and she sequenced it, the closest match she could find to that was in ostriches. Hmm. So we have Dr. Thomas making a claim that dinosaur proteins are far too different to turn into bird proteins without even bothering to check. And we have a real scientist, and a Christian I might add, Dr. Schweitzer actually testing the hypothesis and finding that in the one case we can test, dinosaur protein is actually closest to bird protein. Weird that. Because your metabolism mm -hmm. is integrated at all these different organs mm -hmm. and organ systems and different levels of organization within, mm -hmm. within a creature. Okay, but we haven't heard a single good reason to assume that non-avian dinosaurs had slow metabolisms compared to modern birds. Uh, so to, so yeah, for I think for evolution or natural processes to make all those coordinated changes that would be required to mm -hmm. go from cold to warm. Mm -hmm. 
blood and metabolism. I think it's just a joke. At a basic level, the only real difference between ectothermy, mesothermy, and endothermy is metabolic rate. We know that even varies within a species. For instance, you can find humans who will put on weight after a single day of overeating and need to carefully monitor their calorie intake or they will be overweight. On the other hand, you can find humans who stay skinny even after eating multiple pizzas and washing that down with cake and soda. That's a difference in baseline metabolic rate. Nothing about increasing metabolic rate is hard for evolution, and since evolution isn't a process of giant leaps but is relatively gradual, even under punctuated equilibrium, the various aspects of biology like protein sequence and turbinates and insulation that tend to come along with endothermy can evolve during the mesothermic stage. Nothing here is a problem for evolution, but further, remember, even if it were, we still have reason to think that mesothermy and endothermy were common in dinosaurs, and no reason to think that ectothermy was ubiquitous among them, like these two insist. Mm -hmm. I think it's a joke. It's a biochemist. One of my degrees mm -hmm. is biochemistry. So. so, not paleontology, organismal biology, or evolutionary biology. You know, the relevant fields. Got it. From that perspective, I'm, I'm looking at it from that, from that lens mm -hmm. going, well, you'd have to change you'd have to change everything. You'd have to do a wholesale mm -hmm. rewrite. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a big old citation needed, my man. But did dinosaurs, did any of them have feathers? You hear this a lot in the creation community now as well. Yes, in addition to crowned birds, over 50 dinosaur genera are known to have had feathers from direct evidence, including the aforementioned, by these two, Cynoceropteryx, but also Dylon, Colindodromius, Ornithomimus, Eutyrinus, Cetacosaurus, and Velociraptor, and many others. Uh, you, know, you see this all the time in the news, dinosaur, new feathered dinosaur, new feathered this, new feathered that, and we're constantly writing news articles saying, okay, if you read through the article, what does the article really say? It says that a dinosaur was discovered with direct evidence of feathers. Well, let me start with sort of a few anecdotes. Okay. That's more fun to talk about than okay. articles. Uh, <laughs> One trick is to tell them stories that don't go anywhere. Like the time I caught the ferry over to Shelbyville. But it did start with an article. My anecdote is that... Uh, I needed a new heel for my shoe. I went to a museum in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So, I decided to go to Morganville, which is what they call Shelbyville in those days. And it showed a T-Rex model, a small T-Rex, absolutely covered with feathers. Yeah, why bother talking about a taxon with direct evidence of feathers in the same group of Tyrannosauroidea, like Dialong or Eutyrannus? Instead, let's focus on a taxon for which we have no known feather remains, but that it is phylogenetically possible to have had feathers. We wouldn't want to talk about the direct evidence of feathers, now would we? It looked mm. ridiculous, <laughs> but maybe that's what it was, you know? Mm. I, who am I to mm. say? I wasn't there. Turns out many animals look ridiculous to humans. That doesn't mean they don't or didn't exist. Mm -hmm. But it just didn't seem to fit, and it was just covered with feathers, and of course they put, you know, lots of colored feathers. As opposed to what, clear feathers? That's not really much of a thing. Mm. So there's a lot of, a lot of folks out there who believe that, that even some of the Tyrannosaurids, the smaller mm. ones maybe, had feathers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but only because we've, you know, found the feathers. And some of the evidence for that would be like these fibers that they found associated mm -hmm. with the skeletons in the fossil record. Ah, yes, those fibers with preserved melanosomes, like the ones he accepts in Cynoceropteryx, which preclude them from being collagen frame because collagen doesn't have melanosomes. Only integumentary structures like hair, scale, feathers, and skin have those. Mm -hmm. And um, But other evolutionists have come along and said those fibers really look to us like decayed skin fibers. Because mm -hmm. when your skin decays, it turns into little fibers. No, they don't, and no, it doesn't. What can turn into fibers is collagen. Skin as a whole just rots away. And the only people saying that are Fiducia and company, and they're no longer taken seriously, because as I already mentioned, these fibers are fundamentally incompatible with the identification as collagen fibers, because they have melanosomes, and collagen doesn't. But further, I see what Thomas is doing in just pretending that collagen is synonymous with skin so he can pretend that the fibers are skin fibers because skin does have melanosomes. So he's not just wrong, he's dishonest. Of course, if Dr. Thomas would like to contact me to let me know that he is in fact simply ignorant of the difference between skin and collagen, he may, I'd be happy to find that he's simply an ignoramus instead of a liar. So, so some folks turn those fibers into feathers. Well, does T-Rex mm -hmm. have feathers or not? I think probably not, at least as an adult. It was big enough to not really need them, rather like an elephant, which is an animal that's mostly naked because it doesn't really need fur to keep it warm. Well, just a few years ago, mm -hmm. another researcher went to actual 
preserved skin on mm -hmm. T-Rexes. And he found skin from the tail, which I saw mm -hmm. at the uh, Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman. They've got this huge 30 foot long T-Rex tail, original out of the ground on display. Um, and it's got what? Skin that's sucked right down onto the bone because mm -hmm. that's what happens when a carcass sort of mummifies. Mm -hmm. um, and that skin is covered with bumps, reptile scales, mm -hmm. no feathers on the tail. Actually, the scales known for T-Rex are reticulate, which means they're consistent with the scales found on bird feet, not the scales of lizards or snakes. But we also have skin impressions from several parts of T-Rex. Unfortunately, they're all from parts that are not the parts most likely to have had feathers, since feathers are not a whole body-wide phenomenon, even in modern birds. The parts most likely in known dinosaurs to lack feathers are the ventral side, the thighs, and in some cases the tail. The parts most likely to have had feathers are the dorsal side of the torso and to some extent the dorsal portions of the head and neck, although that's less likely than just the torso. Those areas are where we don't have impressions of skin. So while we can't say for certain if Tyrannosaurus had feathers, we can say that where we can check it did not, and it's big enough to make them unnecessary. But also the places it was most likely to have them, we don't have skin impressions yet. But I still come down on the side of thinking it probably did not have feathers, at least as an adult. And other specimens, actual from the rock, mm -hmm. not speculations about fibers and feathers, show uh, from its belly, from its head, from every major body part. Except the dorsal side of the head, neck, and torso. You know, the places most likely to be feathered. T-Rex was scaly, skin, mm -hmm. scaly, skin, mm -hmm. scaly, skin. So the whole... So then I was like, okay, T-Rex did not have feathers. That conclusion stated as a fact is in no way warranted by the evidence. I happen to think it didn't, but that doesn't mean it didn't. We don't have enough evidence to be definitive either way. So then, so then I'm like, well, what else are they saying had feathers, but the best science shows it was not feathers? I like the phrase, what else? As if he had found an animal for which the consensus opinion is that it was feathered, but he's found contrary evidence. He found evidence that made him reject the still uncertain possibility that a single genus had feathers, Without that evidence being conclusive, and now he's just pretending that T-Rex being feathered is the consensus view, and that someone is suppressing these skin impressions or something, and that the dinosaurs that are actually known to be feathered are similarly the subject of some conspiracy. And I know he didn't explicitly say there's a conspiracy, but if there's evidence sufficient to refute the consensus on integumentary structures of known dinosaurs and no one is talking about it, that's what it would have to be. A conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have not yet seen a feathered dinosaur. A truly dinosaur feathered being dinosaur. open acetabulum, right. mm -hmm. uh, open hip bone, mm -hmm. that's a dinosaur, and then feathers on that. I haven't seen that yet, so I'm waiting to see that. Oh, so like every bird, but also like the ones I mentioned earlier. I'm sorry he's never looked at Velociraptor, except I really doubt that's the case. I think he's just in denial. Well, about, so about a year or two ago, they actually did a big study of the Tyrannosaurs, and they said Tyrannosaurs didn't have feathers. Who are they? What study? When? Where was it published? And of course, what do you mean by Tyrannosaur? Do you mean Tyrannosaurinae? Because yeah, probably not. Do you mean Tyrannosauridae? Because that's less certain, but I'd still be surprised if any Tyrannosaurids were feathery, at least as adults. Do you mean Eutyrannosauria? Because there's a fair chance some of them had feathers. Do you mean Pantyrannosauria or Tyrannosauroidea? Because we know for a fact many of those had feathers. Turns out Tyrannosaur isn't a word that means much. But all the other theropods did. What? No one says that. We know that many ceratosaurs didn't, including ceratosaurus, as well as abelosaurids like Carnotaurus, Rugops, and Majungasaurus. Feathers are almost certainly basal to the theropoda, but they certainly weren't found in all members of the group. Yeah, because they, they know they did, because they turned into birds. No, we know that some definitely did not, but as you get closer and closer to modern birds in terms of anatomy, you get more and more evidence of feathers, and the feathers are more and more similar to modern flight and contour feathers the closer in anatomy you get to birds. So that by the time you're at Deinonychosauria, you have animals with feathers that are essentially identical to modern bird feathers, even though you're still a good way away from crown avies. Right. But they actually did a study, probably using that specimen you talked about, and others, and, and they determined that dinosaurs, the T-Rex type, the, you know, the theropods of the Tyrannosaur family, didn't have feathers. You sure it was a study? You sure it wasn't, you know, nothing? But even if it were a study, something we have no evidence for. It's already known that it's quite likely that Tyrannosaurids were too big to need insulation as adults, so it would be no surprise if they lacked feathers. But they think, you know, well, maybe they when they're really young or... Yeah, when they were small and so needed insulation because gigantothermy isn't useful if you're not gigantic. And Tyrannosaurids started out pretty darn small. But is there direct evidence of this in juvenile Tyrannosaurids? No, there is not. 
We just know that feathers would have had a use, and a presence of feathers is phylogenetically plausible given the animals we know for a fact did have feathers, because again, we found the feathers. Or other, but other ones do. They always put them on Velociraptor. They love to put feathers on Velociraptor, but there's really very little evidence of any feathers on a Velociraptor. You know, except for those ulnar quill knobs, which are kind of like finding a tooth socket on a skull. If you find a skull with a tooth socket, you know the skull had teeth at one point. If you find quill knobs on an ulna, you know the ulna had quills at one point. And what are quills? Oh, that's right, they're feathers. Also, never mind that we have full plumage preserved for Microraptor, which is in the same family as Velociraptor. Presumably, that would make it in the same kind, since we're just pretending that the family level of taxonomy is a real thing in the world of biology, independent of humans arbitrarily defining them. They're really kind of pushing the envelope. It's almost where they're writing science fiction and calling that science. Yeah, nothing says sci-fi like looking at the actual anatomy of an animal and concluding that it did in fact have that evident anatomy. Total fantasy land. I think so. And yeah, in order to mm -hmm. get your dinosaur into a bird, you got to mm -hmm. make it warm-blooded mm -hmm. and you got to put feathers on it. Right. Well, mission accomplished then. We have conclusive evidence of both and at least some dinosaurs, and we have extremely strong evidence that warm-bloodedness goes back before dinosauria, and even some evidence that feathers might as well. So we're finding fibers and turning those into mm -hmm. feathers, and we're finding active mm -hmm. movement, anatomy of active motion, mm -hmm. which we associate with warm-bloodedness, mm -hmm. we, and we make them warm-blooded. So we're trying mm -hmm. to turn them into, yeah. evolutionists are trying to turn these creatures into birds. Nope, they're confirming predictions based on the hypothesis that birds are dinosaurs by observing exactly what Dr. Thomas just confirmed they're observing, but also by observing far more than that, like actual panaceous feathers and bone histology indicative of a metabolic rate consistent with endothermy. Sorry that doesn't fit with Dr. Thomas's pre-concluded beliefs, but science doesn't care, because remember, starting with a conclusion is the opposite of science, and Dr. Thomas is an anti-scientist. Um, but um, if you remove that bias, mm -hmm. what you have is the actual data and it shows in the rocks we've got um, birds separate. Mm. <laughs> okay, okay. Tell you what, Brian. You tell me which of these groups is where we can say we have birds. Manoraptora, Paravies, Aviale, Pigostylia, Ornithorhasis, Ornithoromorpha, Ornithore, or crown birds. At the least bird-like end, we have animals with bird-like feathers and wrists, but that's about it. Then in Paravies, we have wings, that are more specialized for aerodynamics, but still have unfused wing fingers. Then we have Picostylia, where we get shortened bird-like tails. Then in Ornithorhesis, we get the keeled sternum. And in Ornithoromorpha, we're getting the fused wing fingers. And then finally, in Ornithora, we're losing teeth. Where do birds start? Is Velociraptor a bird? What about Archaeopteryx, which has a skeleton almost identical to Velociraptor? How about Jehalornis? Sapiornis? Hesperornis? Also, which ones aren't dinosaurs? Because they all have open acetabula, non-sprawling legs, syncacra, and all the other diagnostic features of dinosaurs. It's actually impossible to draw a non-arbitrary line between birds and dinosaurs, just like it is between humans and apes, because birds are dinosaurs and humans are apes. Dinosaurs separate from birds. Anatomy is different. That's the same argument one could use to say that whales aren't mammals, even though they definitely are. Being unusual among a group doesn't make you not part of the group. Whales are unusual ungulates, but they're ungulates. Birds are unusual dinosaurs, but they're dinosaurs. Humans are unusual apes, but they're apes. Mm -hmm. uh, feathers in the birds, and no bona fide feathers yet for the dinosaurs right. that I've seen. Right. Maybe open your f***ing eyes then. You don't get to ignore the evidence staring you in the face and then act like it wasn't there, and then back it up by lying about bird hips. And, there, and there's a lot of the dinosaurs that they're saying have feathers are actually birds, based on the yeah, anatomy. They call, it, they call it a bird, and guys, that's a dinosaur, and yeah. vice versa. Mm -hmm. If birds are dinosaurs, then of course you can call a bird a dinosaur. And if you want to dispute this, you could, you know, show how birds don't meet the definition of a dinosaur. As for calling non-bird dinosaurs birds, well, I don't know where to draw that line, and we haven't even heard an attempt from these two clowns, so it seems like it's a hard line to draw. Kind of like how creationists can't figure out which fossil apes are humans and which ones aren't. So they all just give different answers, and some of them even give different answers from the answers they themselves had previously given. You know, Microraptor mm -hmm. is a four-winged, feathered dinosaur. Yes, it's not even an aviale, which is the broadest category which I've ever heard called birds. It's in Dromaeosauridae, the family of Velociraptor and Deinonychus. Well, you know what? If it's got four wings and feathers, mm -hmm. we could call it a bird. <laughs> Except, you know, it doesn't have a beak, it has teeth, it has unfused wing fingers, it doesn't have a bird-like coracoid or sternum, it doesn't have a pico style or an alula. 
All characteristics of things we today would call a bird. Weird that. It does though have a skeleton that's almost identical to Velociraptor, including the big killer claw on Pest Digit 2. It's almost like it's a wonderful transitional fossil, demonstrating an intermediate morphology between animals like Tyrannosauroids and animals like birds. Right. <laughs> especially since, especially since we don't have the, uh, the you know, the, um, the, the, the acetabulum. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the f did you just say? We don't have Microraptor acetabula? Since when? Microraptor is known from several nearly complete fossils that include the entire sacrum. We absolutely have its acetabulum. And like all birds and all other dinosaurs, the acetabula are open. Brian, stop lying about dinosaurs. It's obvious and frankly offensive. And at this point, even you don't know what you're talking about. You're deceptively pretending that you do. So ignorance is no longer an excuse. Um, it's a it's a bird. As mm -hmm. It's a bird. Yeah. My director was a bird. And so let's just call it what it is. Right. It had a dinosaur acetabulum. Cool. If you want to say that Velociraptor was a bird, that's weird and no one will agree with you except for some pseudo and anti-scientists, but whatever. All right. Is it possible, do you think, to clone a dinosaur? A bird? Yes. Other dinosaurs? No. We don't have any remaining sequenceable DNA from dinosaurs, nor do we have eggs which would reliably be able to carry a growing embryo to term. And the thing is, they largely agree with me. So although they pretend that dinosaurs are young enough that maybe we could find their DNA, but since for the most part we all agree the answer is basically no, there's no real reason to include their answer. And we showed that they probably were different than birds, just like we've been saying all along. No, that wasn't shown. It was claimed and then outright falsehoods were used to back it up. Well, one thing that just came to my mind that I wanted to mention, from as a geology standpoint, and what's often neglected with the turn into dinosaurs, trying to make dinosaurs turn into birds, is you have dinosaurs here in the rock record, you have birds down here. You know, the, if humans evolved from monkeys, then why are there still monkeys question doesn't become a good objection just because you apply it to birds and other dinosaurs instead of humans and other monkeys. Birds evolved from dinosaurs as one branch of the family tree. The other branches didn't go extinct just because birds had evolved. It makes just as much sense to ask if birds are reptiles, then why are there still lizards? The dinosaurs that didn't evolve into birds, which by the way is literally all of them but one species, didn't evolve into birds. So they're not birds. And that's why we find non-bird dinosaurs after birds evolve. This whole point is just as stupid as saying, well if Anglo-Americans came from Europe, then why are there still Europeans, hmm? Along with the dinosaurs, but the most bird-like dinosaurs are up here. And then in the, you know, in the Cretaceous rocks. Except no, some very bird-like dinosaurs are found in the Jurassic, like Archaeopteryx. It's just that there are some exceptional formations in Cretaceous rocks in China that preserve a wide range of Paravian dinosaurs. That is, the dinosaurs including birds that are most like birds. There is no temporal paradox here. They last the dinosaur rock layers. You get them in the, kind of get them in the mid to late Triassic, and then you get some dinosaurs in the Jurassic layers, and then you get dinosaurs in the Cretaceous, and they all kind of disappear. But the most bird-like ones that claim that dinosaurs are supposedly turned into birds are the ones in the upper Cretaceous. Well, we have feathered birds called Archaeopteryx down in the upper Jurassic layers. Funny thing though, Archaeopteryx lacks an inverted hallux, a keeled sternum, a picostyle, a beak, fused fingers, fused metatarsal bones, and it still has teeth. And it has a basal coracoid bone. So by most definitions, including the classical one from Linnaeus, Archaeopteryx isn't the bird. It's below the dinosaur. No, Brian. Below some dinosaurs and above others. You know, the thing we'd expect. How could birds evolve from dinosaurs and be either the first dinosaurs or come after dinosaurs had gone extinct? That doesn't make sense. The only god possibility for finding fossil birds that base the bird family tree is to find them somewhere between those things. This is like eighth grade biology level stuff here. Basic logic should be enough for you to puzzle this out. If A comes from and is part of B, then can A originate before B? No, of course not. Can it originate after B is gone? No, of course not. It has to, of logical necessity, come about while B is still around, and therefore both A and not A members of class B will be around together for at least some time. I can't believe I have to explain this to two grown men, let alone two PhDs. I refuse to believe that these two are this empty-headed. This is actually giving me a tension headache. You two are supposed to be pretending to be scientists. Do at least a bit better than Kent Hovind. These two are denying reality at the same level as basic arithmetic. This makes no more sense than being skeptical that one and one really sum to two. But then again, is it really any surprise that creationists tend to abandon basic logic? 
which would be, you know, 50 million in the, in the, in the secular worldview, 50 to 70 million years before these dinosaurs were most bird-like. Yup. And that is the biggest problem, in my opinion, is the rocks, again, support, you have birds, you have dinosaurs. You got some birds that couldn't fly as well like Archaeopteryx. They've been doing studies and show Archaeopteryx flew like a pheasant. So it couldn't stay above the water as long as some birds and soar and soar ahead to land. And so these dinosaur or these birds got buried in with the dinosaur rocks earlier than many of the other birds that showed up, you know, later in the rock record because they just couldn't fly as well. These bony-tailed birds that are now extinct today are really couldn't couldn't fly as well, and so they're caught in there. But you've got birds already. Why would they re-evolve later? Dude, Mr. Clary. You already said that birds in the Jurassic were not as bird-like as the ones in the Cretaceous. That's exactly what evolution would predict. What are you talking about with this being a problem for evolution? You just described precisely what we'd expect if birds broadly defined diverged in the Jurassic period. Also, in terms of flying, and since ICR I think that nearly all of the Cenozoic is flood rock, why is it the birds that managed to fly until the Cenozoic rocks were being deposited weren't joined by any similarly built pterosaurs? Why no Paleogene pteranodon, but we do find flightless birds in the Paleogene? Why did their wings shrink mid-flight and then the poor pteranodons were struck down by gods specifically targeting them with lightning? Because, I don't know, maybe pterosaurs are just blasphemous in their own right? What's the model for this? Of course, I know this question will never be answered, not just because these two aren't likely to watch this, but because even if they did, they have no answer. You know, yeah. Why would you evolve them twice? You've already got these birds, and that's often neglected in this story that the sacred world is spinning out there. The narrative that birds evolve twice? No one is spinning that narrative, nor is there any evidence of it. That's just two dunderhead creationists badly misinterpreting the fossil record and just basic logic at best, or lying at worst. Oh, dinosaurs are one blooded, dinosaurs are birds, blah, blah, blah. But, well, how do you explain that you've already got birds way below in the rocks down buried earlier in the flood than the most bird like dinosaurs? And even those bird like dinosaurs have the wrong kind of hips. With the kind of basic logic that we teach in second grade, Mr. Clary, that's how. And also, you two have lied about dinosaur hips and bird hips specifically, so I don't even know how to answer your question there because it's obviously not being asked in good faith. You know, they balance differently, as you pointed out. The, if you kind of pull their legs down to make them walk like a dinosaur, these birds that have feathers, they'd fall over. Even in modern birds, that's just a function of tail length. Here's a clip of what happens when you stick a plunger onto the butt of a chicken. Those tumors come right down like any long-tailed dinosaur. And by the way, Archaeopteryx had a tail long enough to be an effective counterweight, so its femur would have been held more like Tyrannosaurus than like a chicken's. And Dave Menton has actually mentioned that as well and pointed it out to me the first time, and then you've affirmed that in your description. Yeah, when birds walk, they, they, walk they move from their knees, mm -hmm. but when dinosaurs walk, they move mm -hmm. at the hips. Like the thighs, like, yeah, the thighs, the thighs are kind of inside on your chickens and stuff. Yeah, the thighs are more rigid to hold, to hold the... Uh, to hold its shape, to hold those air sacs on the inside. And to... I've already covered Menton's mendacious, meandering speech from the Answers in Genesis. It's basically all wrong. A conclusion shared by actual dinosaur paleontologist and real scientist Darren Nish, as he expressed in the takedown of the same talk that he did with Arn Ra. I've linked my series breakdown above, and I'm sure you'll have no trouble finding Ra's. So if you pull the legs down and walk like a dinosaur does, they'd fall over. They'd be too front heavy. Front heavy, yeah. And so it's it's difficult. It's it's more difficult than they make it out to be. They just think, oh, if you change a little bone here and there, and you got it. What he's describing is literally just pulling the knee up more as the tail shortens. It doesn't even require the femur to change at all. Just the customary angle it's held at. But like as you said earlier, they forget all the physiological changes that have to come along with it as well. There's yeah, many things. Yeah, of changes so we had, at the same time. We it have, just doesn't happen. It does so because all parts of a creature are under selective pressure simultaneously. So while wings are developing, a sternal keel is also developing. And while the knee is becoming the dominant locomotor joint for walking and running, the metatarsals can develop their fuse state. That's just how evolution works. You can't dismiss evolution by saying evolution would have to happen the way it's supposed to in order for evolution to happen. You might as well say you reject gravity because objects accelerate as they fall. Yeah, we know. That's kind of the point. Right, we have feathered extinct birds with bony tails like Archaeopteryx and Microraptor. And then we have, to, to our recollection, to our knowledge today, there are no feathered dinosaurs. You know, except for birds. Which, remember, Messrs. Thomas and Clary have given us no reason to think aren't dinosaurs other than just outright falsehoods. Everything we see is skin, scaly skin, scaly skin, scaly skin, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scaly skin 
dinosaurs that you can see the replicas of, including the T-Rexes. Yeah, you know, if you just ignore all the other dinosaurs like Ophiraptorosaurus, Ornithomimosaurus, Sinoceropteryx, Heterodontosaurus, and Ceratopsians, to name just a few for which direct and indirect evidence of feathers has been found. All right, our last question. We're getting there. And this is your expertise. This is what you got your PhD in. So, Mr. Thomas will have no excuse here. What's so important about finding soft tissues in dinosaur fossils? Well, so the, give us your the, dissertation in a nutshell. Yeah, right. The, it seems pretty obvious that what's important is that it opens up a whole new field of data that we might previously not even have known existed. While the study of soft tissue remnants and molecular fossils is in its infancy, so exactly what we can learn is still up in the air, the possibilities are huge. Just the fact that we've confirmed that Tyrannosaurus collagen is very similar to bird collagen is amazing and a wonderful confirmation of the fact that birds are dinosaurs. But let's hear Brian screw it up by lying about what it implies for the age of fossils. When you say tissues, you're not mm -hmm. talking about Kleenex, you're talking about like blood mm -hmm. vessels and mm -hmm. uh, connective tissue, like actual tissue, including cells. Osteocyte cells, cells, yeah. No actual blood vessels or cells have been found. Residue of them that's still in roughly the original shape has been found. Not just osteocyte, but uh, other cells too. And um, boy, that that's not supposed to be in any kind of, you know, any kind of fossil mm. that's that's a million years old or more. Mm. Or so we thought. Then we found mechanisms to cross-link proteins naturally during fossilization, as well as finding that some of the molecular fossils are actually degraded versions of proteins that are so stable that they have an effectively infinite shelf life. Interestingly enough, humans had already been using cross-linking to preserve organic tissue in not the same state as life, but close enough that it can be studied or used. Cross-linking is how the protein in skin can be preserved to create tough and long-lasting leather. Similarly, formaldehyde that is used to preserve biological samples preserves exactly by cross-linking. Dr. Schweitzer herself found experimentally that iron in blood can provide cross-linking for protein in fossil bone, thereby preserving segments of protein, including some of their mechanical properties. But in no way are the proteins, blood vessels, or cells in these finds simply intact. What we've been saying is that the flood... The flood that we know for a fact didn't happen. Right. Off to a great start. The flood deposited these layers 4,500 or so years ago. All these layers. Mm -hmm. And so, the di including the dinosaur layers. Mm -hmm. And so, if that's the case... Then the rock types would be sorted by density, with the highest at the bottom and the lowest at the top, and organisms would themselves be created in the sediment by hydrodynamic properties. Also, we would find absolutely no subaerial deposits, and absolute testing for age would return either consistently the same age or essentially random ages, depending on whether this conspiracy theory invalidates nuclear physics to somehow make radiometric dating not work. Unfortunately, none of this is what we see, which is how we know that there was no global flood. But continue, Brian. Um, then maybe there's some... Maybe there's tissue in there mm -hmm. that could have lasted for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And we know that certain proteins can last. Mm -hmm. Tissues are made of proteins. Mm -hmm. Can last thousands of years. Cool, so go find an intact protein in a dinosaur bone. And make sure you show your work, unlike Mark Armitage, who was allergic to actually having proper method sections in his papers. Um, but they can't last a million at the, you know, at Earth's surface temperatures. You'd have to get it and liquid that, nitrogen that, to get and that, it. And that's even under ideal conditions. Hence why we don't have any intact Mesozoic dinosaur proteins. It's ideal. Unlike what's exposed, like in Montana, we got freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw, right near the surface, water trickling in. Bacteria you action. Know, yeah, so life is rough mm -hmm. for a protein underground. Uh, Good thing some of them got cross-linked or decay into stable forms so that they can get the remnants of them today. As, and and mm -hmm. with more time, you know, there's more opportunities for chemistry mm -hmm. to happen and for bacteria to, de mm -hmm. to uh, degrade it and for chemistry to decay it. So, um, and then there's radiation that mm -hmm. breaks apart these molecules, yeah. but they're still inside the bones, which makes us think that, hey, the flood got it right, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, let's forget everything we know about physics, astronomy, radiation, geology, taphonomy, sedimentology, genetics, etc. Or maybe there are some new preservation mechanisms to discover. I wonder which of those is more likely. We're wrong about basically all of science, or we have a bit more to learn about protein cross-linking. Hmm, big conundrum there. The flood really is is the explanation for mm -hmm. how you get fossils in the first place, how mm -hmm. you get rock layers, and how you get tissues mm -hmm. still in them, because it's, it's recent. Mm -hmm. So to me, this says the Bible got it right. Too bad the only evidence we have concerning a global flood is direct evidence that it didn't happen. If the Bible's right about where we came from, then it's right about who we are mm -hmm. and our need for a savior. Yeah, maybe don't tie your theology to a demonstrably wrong interpretation of Genesis. Or do and be wrong. It's not my life you're wasting. 
But if there's a god you're going to answer to, he might not be happy that you spent your life lying about science while pretending to do it for him. The rest of their talk is just preaching. I'm going to assume my whole audience is reasonably familiar with the theology of fundamentalist evangelical Protestantism. If you're not, feel free to look into it elsewhere. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video with Drs. Thomas and Clary talking about dinosaurs. Robert, I did not in fact enjoy it. It was infuriatingly inaccurate and in ways I have trouble assuming were honest mistakes, given the education of the two speakers. If your question didn't get answered, you can pick up a creation Q&A booklet by going to store.icr.org. I would rather stick screws into my fingers, but okay, that's it for this series, everybody. It's still nearly incomprehensible to me how badly wrong creationists will get dinosaurs, and for very little reason. They could just accept that birds are dinosaurs and say that they died off right after the flood. Sure, the second part still makes God look incompetent, but honestly, the whole flood does that anyway, if you take it literally. Oh well. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and to turn on the bell icon and choose all notifications so you're always notified when I have new content. If you like this video, hit like and leave a comment telling me what you enjoyed. If you didn't like it, feel free to dislike the video and tell me what your problems are with it. Either way, I hope to see you again. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Benthoven, Tapioca Weasel, Denny5252, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mabdi Babdi, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Atheist Animal. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month, my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting, so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.